Good to go. We're good? We're good? Give a little tap. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2024 Peter Mac Women in Science Symposium and Leah Medal presentation. Thank you to everybody who is here in person here in Parkville, and also to everyone who's joined us online. We're gonna start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, paying our respects to all elders past and present and acknowledging any elders who are here with us today. Before we run through the plan for today, um, we're going to do a few introductions and a little bit of housekeeping. I am Associate Professor Laura Forrest, and I'm joined here today by Dr. Laurie Smith. Together, we co-chair the Research Gender Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee here at Peter Mac, and we're gonna be your hosts today. If you require bathrooms, they're just uh, today, they're just down that way on your left, located in the corridor opposite the lecture theatre. We're gonna be pausing for morning tea at 10.30 for about 30 minutes. And we hope that that gives everybody enough time to meet and connect and chat about what we've heard so far. Laurie and I are both past Leah medalists. Our work and careers have benefited hugely from the funding that we've received through our awards and also from the prestige of this accolade. I have very vivid memory from my work experience in a hospital as a year 10 student, being advised by a senior medical doctor that he thought, as a woman, I should not consider a career in medicine after high school. <laughs> he opined that women medical practitioners interrupted the workforce too much when they had children. I inferred that this type of workforce, for in this type of workforce, women who had babies would not be welcome and neither would men who shared parenting responsibilities. Being awarded the Leah Medal has resulted in tangible outcomes for me, like contributing to being awarded a VCA Mid-Career Fellowship, but also through more intangible means. The Leah Medal is an acknowledgement that here at Peter Mac, the cancer research community, including the executive and the board, is working to recognise and celebrate diversity. And while my diversity might be a little more mainstream, experiencing a lifetime of gendered comments and assumptions about my ability could have poured me out of that leaky pipeline of women researchers, um, particularly around the time that I was having children, returning to work, and experiencing the inevitable loss of productivity due to a generalised sense of a failure to fire. Except that I know that I'm valued here at Peter Mac, the Leah Medal is not a Band-Aid solution to the entrenched issue of sexism. 
but it is an acknowledgement and the encouragement which have gone a long way to bolster my confidence and in my ability to persist and to be resilient, to be bold and to be brave in pursuing my research ideas. It has contributed to me standing up here today, freshly promoted in 2023, as evidence of my research career trajectory so far. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Laura, it's going to be hard to follow up from that. <laughs> So yeah, um, in 2021, I was also a recipient of um, the Leah Medal um, and it really came at a critical point in my career and gave me the opportunity to really boost the research and my global exposure, form new collaborations to make sure that my science was at world's best, but also just gave me that confidence boost and that recognition of, um, of the work I was doing around here at Peter Mac. And I think it really has been a critical turning point. So in 2022, um, that culminated in me being awarded a Victorian Cancer Agency Mid-Career Research Fellowship, similar to Laura. And more recently, I've had success in other funding schemes, which is a real game changer for me. Um, and I really attribute a lot of that success to back to that turning point of getting the Leah Medal. So, so grateful to Peter Mac for supporting um, this initiative. And so I also wanted to reflect more broadly about what this uh, means, especially in the broader landscape of what's happened this week. So earlier this week, some of you might have seen that the data on the gender pay gap across medium and large size Australian businesses was released, showing a current gender pay gap in Australia of 19%. And so the transparency of this will hopefully help close this gap, but it highlights the continued importance of affirmative actions, exactly like the Leah Medal that we're here to celebrate today, um, it had the importance of these to help close this gap between men and women in medical research. So we've got a lot to get through today and an exciting lineup of speakers. Um, but we're also looking forward to hearing from you too. So we'll be taking questions for each guest speaker through the Menti platform. And I believe you will see a barcode. <laughs> the number is 57738590. Um, we will start with an introduction and welcome from the Peter Mac Board Chair, Professor Maxime Moran. It's a real pleasure to have you join us here again today, Maxime. Um, and the Leah Medalists for 2024 will then be announced uh, by our new CEO, Professor Jason Payne. Um, before morning tea, we'll hear from Louise Purton, who will deliver today's keynote um, address. Um, and then we'll hear from a Peter Mac consumer advisor, Elaine Curie, our two Leah medalists, um, and our second invited speaker, Professor Sue Walker. But for now that you've heard enough from us too, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Mac's board chair, Professor Maxime Moran, who we're delighted to have with us here today. Thank you, Laurie and Laura. And this is fantastic to see so many people in the room, uh, so many people from Peter Mac, from our precinct partners, and I know that there are people here and online from, from Monash and Swinburne and Flory, some international, uh, I'm sorry, some other national uh, bodies. I think there's someone from Telethon Kids in Western Australia dialing in, and also some industry partners. So it's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. But what we're here today, as Laurie and uh, Laura outlined is to celebrate you, to celebrate women in research. And I think you'll have to indulge me because this is my last Women in Science Symposium, an event that I've absolutely loved because it does shine a light on the amazing research done by fabulous women here at Peter Mac. I want to briefly reflect on the gender equity journey at Peter Mac over the last nine or so years and just briefly touch on progress and equity in medical research globally. In 2015, Peter Mac's Research Gender Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee was established. And I want to give a shout out to our former CEO, Dale Fisher, who was instrumental in establishing that. It's a staff led committee, enthousi enthusiastically backed by our board and by our executive. And this group continues to drive change um, and in a, a valued, really valuable forum for exchanging ideas about diverse, diversity and inclusion. The committee has now evolved to consider broader aspects of diversity and inclusion as the Research Gender Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. The Leah Medal and Women in Science Symposium were jointly established in 2017, and both initiatives provide important advancement, networking and profile raising opportunities, as, as you've both articulated so very well. So all of the Leah award recipients have done incredibly well since getting this important recognition. 
This includes 30% of recipients have taken up group leader positions, fantastic achievement. Nearly half have received Victorian Cancer Agency fellowships, which is a critical stepping stone to senior research leadership positions. <clears throat> and in, and I just wanted to say that that, that is so important. One of the most important things about the Lear Award is, is the stepping stone for uh, recognition. Then in 2022, we released Peter Mack's four-year gender equity action plan. And I wanted to touch on the fact that we are seeing improvements in gender balance, uh, particularly today to note the, the change in ba gender balance in research leadership, leadership positions. In 2021, uh, Peter Mack achieved gender parity at level D associate professor positions. I don't know if we've got a graph. Yes, we do. 51% of, of these positions are now occupied by women. And this is an increase from only 36% in 2017. In level E, professor appointments for women increased from 17.5% to 25% in 2021. And that's, that's a, a good achievement, but I wanted to note that there's still obviously a long way to go with only 25% of women in that uh, highest level. Peter Mack has, and I'm proud that Peter Mack has set targets to reach gender parity in the combined levels of D and E by 2040. This is going to take some time, as everybody would appreciate. It actually takes some time. We'll see um, some of our senior wonderful men retire and they'll be replaced by women. And I wanted to acknowledge the work that um, the research executive have put into this and to Ricky Johnson, I think he's here today. You know, they are really committed to making a difference in this space. <clears throat> so uh, Laurie mentioned the, um, the pay gap, and I think it does deserve a mention because WIGA published its latest data this week, and as you said, it's a 90% pay gap. And in fact, some of our biggest and most well-known companies were found to have the biggest gaps. So take a look. It's very interesting. Companies like Qantas was at 33% median and the Commonwealth Bank at 30%. So I think it's really good to have that data um, exposed and scrutinised. Our data from um, Peter Mack shows that there is a mean gender pay gap of 13% in cancer research division and an 11% medium. I'm not sure if we've got that. So that compares to the global Peter Mac staff is also a median of 11%. But I did want to note that the overall, you know, the difference, obviously you'd appreciate better than I do as, as science people, that mean is obviously an average and median is the middle point. And if you include uh, the average, which obviously is skewed enormously by very highly paid senior medical clinicians in at Peter Mac, the gap is 32%. So there's quite a journey ahead, and I want to assure you that the board um, and the executive are looking closely at how we can close that gap. We have great support from the foundation. I know Kate Tawney is here. I wanted to give it a shout out to you and to acknowledge that the, cap, the foundation has funded schemes to support women researchers. In 2023, three researchers received $30,000 to maintain their research momentum during and after long parental leave through the Research Momentum for Parents Scheme. Six researchers from laboratory and clinical programs received subsidies of up to $10,000 through our Parental Leave Scheme. And Parenting While Researching Grants and Aid Program assisted 24 researchers who are parents or carers with grants of up to $3,000 for non-standard childcare needs. And to simplify this, we have now centralised parental leave funding scheme, making it easy, easier for researchers to access support while caring for their families. And finally, in 2023, we welcome two dedicated diversity inclusion consultants to Peter Mac, and they are doing a fantastic work to help keep us focused on, the, on that important change that we need to make. And just finally, globally, um, I should mention the special measure, measure introduced by the NHMRC to address systematic disadvantage faced by female and non-binary applicants in its investigator scheme. Under these new measures, equal numbers of investigator grants were awarded to men and women in 2023. And guess what? The, the sky didn't fall down. <laughs> there was a lot of people that were very worried about this, but... It's been wonderful, and I, I've, this measure is the result of sustained lobbying from interest groups and organisations, and we'll be hearing from one of the lead advocates 
to, in the Drive Towards Equity Investigator Grant Scheme, Professor Louise Purton, one of the founders of Equity and Australia in Equity and Australian STEM advocacy team. Also wanted to give a shout out to Amri, who've been very um, active in the JEDI space. And most recently, I joined with our partners, uh, WISP, to launch the Respect and Research Report <coughs> with uh, the Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner at our convention in November in Canberra. And I chair the Gender Equity Committee, and I wanted to acknowledge the fantastic participation of committee members from institutes right around Australia and from our very own Sarah Russell. I don't know if you're in the audience, Sarah. And the recently departed um, Louise Johansson from WeHi, who were both instrumental in developing this important respect and research report. So it's great progress, but there's a lot more to do. And I think with leaders like Laurie and Laura and Shireen and many others at Peter Mac, and with the support of our new chief executive and the executive and the board, there's lots to do and that lots will get done in the future. So I've just reflected on the last few years, but we owe a great deal of debt to many women who've contributed to Peter Mac over its 75 year history. And this year we are celebrating 75 years of Peter Mac. And it's been interesting to go through the archives and to see that there were a lot of women who've contributed enormously to the success of Peter Mac, who may not have been acknowledged or recognized, um, but who have, you know, contributed to where we are today, which we are, we are ranked 14 globally in the world for oncology hospitals, not too shabby. So uh, the comms team have developed a, um, a video, which we're about to share, which hopefully recognises some of the incredible contributions of women to Peter Mac in the last 75 years. Thanks, everybody.
Wow, what a truly inspiring video. I actually felt quite emotional <laughs> uh, watching that video. And I knew a number of faces in there, which was terrific. And I can see some of the um, previous uh, Leah Award uh, medalists um, in the room today with us, which is fantastic. So welcome everybody. My name is Professor Jason Payne. I'm the Chief Executive at Peter Mac, and it's wonderful, wonderful to be with you all this morning. It's my pleasure, I get to do the fun bit really, to present the 2024 Leah Medals. And I'd like to thank Board Chair uh, Professor Maxine Moran, Morand AM, for joining me to present this year's awards. Named after the Latin word for lioness, the Leah Medal was established in response to historic gender imbalances in the senior ranks of health and science. Now in its eighth year, the award helps to raise the profile of Peter Mack women identifying researchers in the critical early to mid stages of their career, a time when many face barriers and lack support. Each recipient will receive $50,000 in support from generous donations to the Peter McCallum Cancer Foundation to enable them to access career progression opportunities. Past recipients of the Leah Medal have used the funding to travel overseas, establish international research collaborations, complete further research training, fund research students and attend conferences. This is the fourth year that two Leah Medals have been awarded, recognising female leaders in the categories of dedicated researcher and clinician researcher. In the Leah Medal selection process, the top four applicants were invited to present an elevator pitch to the selection panel. Reaching this stage of the selection process is a significant achievement in itself. And being on the um, selection panel is a very, very difficult decision. It was such high calibre applications. It was truly amazing. And I did say to Ricky afterwards, how else can we um, support these amazing uh, women in science? But I would like to acknowledge and recognise the two runners-up for 2024, Dr Deborah Mayron and Dr Apano Rao, and I congratulate both of you and thank you for your work. So we might give them a round of applause. Uh, without further ado, I will introduce and congratulate our first winner, Dr Dineka Chandrananda. Congratulations, Dineka. Got your hands full. <laughs> There's your award. We'll just put it around. Um, Dr. Chandrananda is a senior research officer in Peter Max Molecular Biomarkers and Translational Genomics Lab. She leads a bioinformatics team that develops methods to retrieve multi omic data from circulating tumor DNA, including methylation changes, mutational signatures, inferred gene expression, and fragmentomics information. Her current research focuses on integrating these data layers through machine learning to detect residual disease after curative therapy and to monitor how tumours evolve and acquire resistance as patients undergo treatment. Dr Chandrananda is funded through a VCA Early Career Fellowship and an NHMRC Ideas Grant. Her ongoing passion is to translate these minimally invasive methodologies to the clinic please join me in extending our congratulations to Dineka. Thank you, Jason and Maxine. Oh. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a great honor to receive the Leah Medal this year. And I want to thank the Gender Equality and Diversity and Inclusion Committee, the board and everyone else at Peter Mac who championed this award um, and recognize its importance to mid-career researchers. I'm very grateful to Ricky and the rest of the selection committee for their time and energy spent on this process. Uh, and I want to say a special thank you to Katie Fennell and Laurie Smith, 
previously a medal winners who have been so encouraging and supportive of me as uh, I applied for this medal. This award will be a great stepping stone as I gain greater independence in my research and I will definitely put it to good use. It takes a community to develop leaders and it is truly humbling to reflect on all of the people and mentors who have helped me along the way. And even if many of them are not here in the audience today, it is important that I highlight their influence. So Stefan Ginden, Sharon Browning, and Christopher Wild, who are my honors and master supervisors and first academic boss, all from the statistics department from the University of Auckland. These three mentored me when I was new to research. They are patient, compassionate, and flexible supervision styles have been something I try to emulate as I supervise junior scientists myself. Um, then comes Melanie Barlow, Natalie Thorne, and Terry Speed, my PhD supervisors at WEHI. They were instrumental in building my confidence, my critical thinking skills, resiliency, and independence. My PhD journey was tough, but they guided me through it. My tribe at Peter Mac <laughs> is the amazing group of scientists in the Dawson Labs. They are creative, collaborative, and just the right amount of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the reasons I come to work is because I get to work with them. So thank you all. And shout out to Mark Dawson for being so infectious with his enthusiasm for science and discovery. And thank you, Mark, for always giving me your time when I need it, even in the middle of a hectic schedule. And of course, I wouldn't be receiving this award today without the incredible support of Sarah Jane Dawson. Sarah Jane has provided a fantastic and equitable environment to do some great science and given me so many opportunities to grow as a scientist. Sarah Jane will always be the role model for me for assertive leadership underpinned by a reservoir of compassion. Thank you, Sarah Jane. Finally, I am so grateful for my wonderful parents for their unwavering support uh, in all that I choose to do. My mother has been my greatest academic role model because she completed her PhD as a mature student with three young children in the middle of a civil war and she did it in four years. <laughs> my father is a role model in how he supported my mom in this endeavor and held down the fort while she was away doing field work. I still rely on their wisdom and their advice and their quiet encouragement makes me be a better scientist. With that, I want to thank everyone for coming today to support women in science. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Chandrananda. That was a really inspiring speech and congratulations once again, and we wish you all the best with your continued work. Now to award the second Leah Medal for 2024. Uh, this award goes to a Peter Mac clinician researcher and congratulations to infectious diseases physician and researcher, Dr. Abby Douglas. Dr. Douglas is an infectious diseases physician and postdoctoral clinician researcher. Her area of interest surrounds improving diagnostics and management of fever and infection in heavily immunocompromised hosts. She completed her PhD in, through the National Centre of Infections in Cancer at Peter Mac in 2023, where she studied the potential benefits of FDG PET CT in diagnosing and managing invasive fungal infections and neutropenic fever. She was awarded the Peter Mac Medal for this work. Her world first randomized trial comparing FDG PET CT to conventional CT imaging in persistent and recurrent neutropenic fever found that FDG PET CT was superior in guiding antimicrobial management and was associated with reduced length of stay. 
Dr. Douglas is the Implementation Fellow of the NCIC and on the steering committee of several international trials. She's a lead author and steering committee member of the Australian and New Zealand Consensus Guidelines for Management of Neutropenic Fever and clinical trial lead of the Australia and New Zealand Mycology Interest Group. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Douglas on her award today. Thank you, everyone. Um, I wasn't as brilliant and poetic and beautiful in my, my um, production of my talk today, so a bit, a bit of a um, hard act to follow, but um, I really want to thank the JEDI group for all their work uh, and the Leah Medal Selection Committee for choosing me. It is truly a, a great honour and very humbling. I'd really like to thank the organisers organisers of this wonderful event and really I appreciate the recognition of women in science and anything that can be done to, to promote that is, is top of my list um, and thank you for everyone for attending. I'd really like to thank the National Centre for Infections in Cancer for their hard work and support and in, particularly to my supervisors Professor Monica Slaven and Karen Thersky who have really guided me uh, and helped me to be where I am today um, and really are fearless champions for women in science and are uh, uh, wonderful role models of what women can do uh, in the field. Um, and being an infectious uh, diseases physician, we really have to work in collaboration with other units and they have to trust us with, um, with trying to perform research and care for their patients. So I'd really like to thank the haematology uh, and transplant department in particular, as well as the nuclear medicine department, um, medical nursing technicians who really have been wonderful in facilitating um, the work and entrusted me with their patients. I'd like to thank the University of Melbourne for their assistance along the journey and the Peter Mac Foundation as well as the Royal Melbourne Foundation who really helped to um, fund some of the research as well as the NHMRC for their funding and support uh, without which I, I couldn't do any of this, this work. Um, on a personal note, I'd really like to thank my husband and my two young children for their understanding and patience, and particularly my children, who are really my number one cheerleaders along the way and um, really keep me going. Um, and in particular, I'd really like to have a very big call out and special thanks to my mother, Kay Douglas, for her wonderful support and belief in me. She has set the example for what can be achieved by a woman, um, particularly you know, in adversity, uh, with her sheer grit and determination. Um, she really fought for us and has allowed her children to achieve all that they can achieve. I'm really excited for what I can achieve with this award and I really thank you for this distinct honour. <laughs> Congratulations again, Dr. Douglas. What an amazing, amazing achievement. And we look forward to you and Dr. Chandrananda presenting after morning tea. Uh, Peter Mack is really fortunate to have such uh, talent across the whole spectrum of our research program. And it's amazing to um, he hear from our two award recipients today. It's absolutely amazing achievement and well, well done. So thanks for um, joining us this morning for the presentation of the awards and I'd like now like to hand back to our host Dr Laurie Smith and Associate Professor Laura Forrest to introduce our keynote speaker. Great so yeah thanks Professor Moran and Professor Payne for presenting this year's um, Leah medals and congrats again to the recipients. Um, can't wait to see what you're going to do. Um, so also want to give another special thanks to the Peter McCallum Cancer Foundation and all of the generous donors for their support. Um, and more broadly than the, for the Leah medals, they really underpin a lot of the work that our um, research JEDI committee is able to deliver um, on. So yeah, and 
Now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Professor Louise Purton. So Professor Purton is currently lab head at St. Vincent's Medical Research Institute. She's a former associate director at the Institute um, and was also founding lead of St. Vincent's Stem Cell Regulation Unit. She's internationally recognized for her research in the field of blood cells and her work spans fundamental to translational research. And so her career has spanned almost 30 years and Professor Purton has spent several years working here at Peter Mac, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and also the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. So her research has helped us understand how blood cell production is regulated in both normal and disease states and her discovery research has resulted in four clinical trials to date, which is really an amazing achievement and the goal of all of us in the lab. Um, there's many things that I could um, really note about Louise, but I really want to give a shout out. She's a committed advocate for equity and inclusivity. Um, she's a founder of the Equity and Australian STEM Advocacy Team. And this grassroots um, organisation is comprised of Australian academic researchers who recognise the inequities that contribute to the lack of retention of people in underrepresented groups in Australian STEM. So in 2023, Professor Purton was awarded the International Society for Experimental Hematology Award for Leadership, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, and I also want to note that Professor Purton has had a bilateral hearing impairment since she was a child and has received two successful cochlear implants in recent years, which really kind of adds to this volume of success that she's been able to achieve. And so with that, it's my real pleasure to introduce and welcome Louise up to the podium and can't wait to hear what you've got to say today. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. It's great to see so many people and also those online. Thank you for joining us. I've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to get started, but um, I would like to say that intersectionality is very important to me and also catering for people with a range of disabilities, not just my own. So all of my slides are actually uh, designed to do that, uh, to cater for people with a range of disabilities. Uh, I'm on Twitter, or which I hate to say it now, and that's my... Uh, <laughs> but I still do get out there and post. So if you want to follow me, you're very welcome to. Okay, so we start from the very beginning. So as Laurie said, I have a profound hearing impairment. Uh, it was a bit of a mystery when I lost my hearing, when you lost it when I was a child. Um, but discussions with my audiologist have revealed that I likely lost it after I developed my speech. And I had an intestinal abscess when I was three. I was in hospital for three weeks with tubes draining uh, my body. And as a result of that, they cannot stitch you up properly. They stitch you up with loose stitches and they put you on high dose antibiotics. And we think that that is what caused my hearing loss. So it used to be a bit better than this. Um, you can actually see uh, this is an audiogram uh, and I use this in teaching. So normal hearing is here. You would go across here uh, and then you go to profound. And what happens is that they will um, play soft to loud sounds and you would uh, click. And what would happen is so the loud sounds are here and the soft sounds are here. And you can see here that I have no response at all in this area here. Um, since my cochlear implants, I don't have to have audiology exams anymore, which I'm really happy about. Uh, it gave me anxiety every time because I knew that I would not hear much at all. And that's exactly the case. Uh, and these are the sounds that I cannot hear. So that equates into all of the sounds. So most of the consonants uh, I cannot hear. And that's what people usually use to rely on in terms of hearing. So I rely on vowels. Uh, I cannot hear whispers. I've never been able to hear whispers. And in school, when you played that game, never put me in the middle or anywhere. I, it was really, really bad. Uh, and prior to my first cochlear implant, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, I could only repeat 6% of words without lip reading. So I was highly reliant on lip reading. And my cochlear audiologist, who has examined many, many patients over her life, has said I'm the best lip reader that she's ever encountered. And I'm self-taught. I cannot follow conversations in noisy environments. I have a device on my cochlears now that can cut out background noise. I'm probably better than most people now. Um, and people think I have a foreign accent. It's improved. In fact, within a week of having my first cochlear implant, my voice is, I noticed and my husband noticed that my voice had changed. 
So let's talk about my hearing loss. So I was born in 1968. I grew up in a small country town called Bar Reynold in southern New South Wales. So it's a population of 1,100 people now. I was 1,400 when I was a child. So everyone knows everyone. Everyone knows what everyone's doing. Um, and I'm the first person to get a PhD from my hometown. So they're very proud of me and I'm very proud of have coming from that crowd. Uh, from me. So when I was five, my mother noticed that I did not respond to her if I had my back turned to her, like watching TV. Uh, she had to drive me to Mordura, which was an hour and a half each way, uh, took me to an ENT there. He tested my lows, uh, frequencies, uh, which at the time were normal. He said there was nothing wrong and, and sent us home. Uh, my mum was a school teacher, so when, she, when I was eight, an audiologist visited our school and she asked the audiologist if she would test my hearing. She tested everything and discovered that I had no high frequencies. So back we went to Mondura, initially he just tested my lows, said there was nothing wrong with me, uh, and then she insisted that he test my highs. Uh, and so he said, well, okay, she's got no high frequencies, there are no hearing aids for her condition, uh, the only thing that will impact her is that she will not appreciate classical music, which is complete nonsense. Um, so between the ages of 12 and 19, I didn't have any assessments at all. My parents were not told that I needed to or there was a lack of communication. Uh, I didn't have any assistance at school. I taught myself to let breathe. I do not sign. I've never been exposed to uh, the deaf community in that sense. And despite the fact that um, that I did all of that, I excelled at school. I uh, obtained the marks to do medicine and chose to do science. And I don't regret that. Um, and also, I love music. I sang in two school choirs voluntarily until the end of year 11. We were really good. We, were, we had an eight a group, magical group, which is voices only. We used to compete in the stead pits and win all the time against adults. So we were really good. And my love of music was also a reason I was reluctant to have cochlear. So I will talk about that in a little bit. So my life as a person with a profound hearing loss. So while I have a visible disability, uh, most people don't see it. So they expect me to be normal. This happens all the time. Uh, so people stare at me if I do not respond to them when they expect me to respond to them. Uh, people also stare at me because my voice is loud, it gets louder. If I'm in a noisy environment because I cannot hear and that's my way of compensating. Um, people think I'm rude because I can talk too much, uh, particularly on platforms like Zoom. I'm getting used to that now. I'm trying to consciously reduce that. And I tend not to ask people too much about themselves, as particularly in noisy environments, because I just can't hear them. Um, and um, I tend to talk more about myself and my life. And so that also reflects on me as well. And I only realized a few years ago when I was speaking uh, at a deaf and communication unit at Melbourne Uni, and I got to learn um, from the person speaking before me about these sorts of things, that these are just common traits which made me feel a bit better about myself. <laughs> but it's also important to publicise this. So if you're dealing with someone who has a profound hearing loss or hearing loss in any way, these are just normal things. So I'm going to talk about uh, cochlear implants. So in 2018, I had an episode of what they call sudden hearing loss. Uh, it meant that my bad low frequencies went even worse. And, and so I had to go on high dose steroids. I was given too high a dose. I went through a really nightmare uh, side effects, and I was in Seattle for part of that time in the in ER twice. Um, they'd given me the dose that they would normally give a man. So uh, it also highlights the importance of doing lots of research in, in women. Um, but I was then also diagnosed with an acoustic neuroma, which is a benign tumor, but it can be activated anytime and it affects your hearing and also it can affect your balance. So to date, it hasn't affected my balance but there's no guarantee that it's not going to be active and it's no way of knowing if it's active. And it shocked me into realising that I needed my first cochlear implant. So this is what a cochlear implant is. Most people are not really aware of them and I like to publish that's what they have. So there's an internal part here. Uh, and this is it here. This is a magnet here. Uh, and then this is the magic here. This is the external processor. You can see it here. 
I've got a really great party trick where I've got this uh, necklace that's magnetic and I can just, just attach it to the side of my head. So I do it. I do have a sense of humor and I like to have a bit of fun. Um, and then this here was drilled. So the, the actual cochlear implant itself, the uh, little bit, the electrodes were implanted. Uh, it was all behind my ear and drilled in through the cochlear. And you can see it here. And these are the 22 channels. And these bypass my uh, hair cells and they transmit to uh, my brain. My ability to understand speech without lip reading, there were no guarantees because the longer you go without a hearing, uh, without a cochlear implant, uh, the less likely you are to succeed. I've been an outlier and they keep on monitoring me because, because I've done so well. So before I used to get 6% of words with lip reading, uh, without lip reading and that was largely guessing, not confident at all. Uh, at three months for second cochlear implant, I could get 60% of words and confidently and that's increased to 80%. So it keeps on going um, better um, and it's really made a bit, big difference to my life. I want to briefly talk about my research career. Uh, so, and you have to remember that most of that was done with the hearing loss that I had. So my PhD was really self-taught. It was on bone marrow endothelial cells in a lab that wasn't equipped for it, trying to replicate work that actually was incorrect because they didn't use appropriate controls. And to date, no one has managed to do what I was trying to do back then, and that is to grow mouse bone marrow endothelial cells in culture. You can only do it if you want to mobilize them. Um, but I was really fortunate that I got a bursary to go to Manchester for six months of my PhD. The British Council funded me. Uh, and during that time, I went to a conference in Glasgow and Judah Folkman was there. He's a, one of the biggest names in angiogenesis. He passed away in 2008 of a heart attack. Um, and he came up, uh, he presented at the conference and at the end of his talk, he said that he was really interested in getting into bone marrow endothelial cells. And I thought, oh, wow. And I went up to him after his talk and, and I said, well, I'm you know, really excited to hear that because that's what I'm working on. Uh, and he shook me by the arms. He's like, you have to come to Boston. And I'm like, I'm just a PhD student. You have to come to Boston, I'll pay for you. And I'm like, oh, no, this is not gonna happen. Um, and so then I went to another conference uh, in, in um, Rotterdam and I spoke to the guy whose work I was actually trying to replicate. And he was in Seattle. And I said to him, well, Judah Folkman's told me he's going to fly me to Boston. He said, well, if he flies you to Boston, I'll fly you to Seattle. So come to Seattle as well. And so I get back to Manchester and there was a fax. And this is a time when we used faxes. Not email was just coming in. That's how old it was. Um, and, and it all happened. And so actually from that, I lined up my job in Seattle, my postdoc. Um, and so I went there. Uh, and I say that because I'm trying to encourage everyone, you know, it's up to you what you do with your career. You can't just wait for someone to push you and things happen when you're not expecting them. So my first postdoc was a woman. She was one of the only ones working in microenvironment cells at the time. It was a really uh, tough time. She and I clashed for a number of reasons. And she ran out of funding for my work, um, but she also told me not to try and find another position in Seattle, that there were no jobs. And then she was calling them up. Uh, when I was interviewing, I had eight uh, job interviews within a week in Seattle, I was determined to stay there. Uh, and she was calling them and trying to convince them that I didn't do the work, that I wasn't working hard, et cetera. But I was fortunate that I was given another postdoc in the same institute, uh, and this really was a major break in my career. Uh, and so I was actually based in the labs of two people, so Irv, who works on Notch, and Steve, who was a retinal acid person. Uh, and they wanted me to set up the mouse hematopoietic stem cell system, which I'd never worked on before. Uh, and Irv really wanted it for the Notch work. And Steve was retinoid, so they were like, well, we're really not sure if this is going to be interesting, but you can use this. And it actually turned out to be better than not, <laughs> so it was really good. So then I was recruited back to Melbourne, and I was promised a lab of my own. I actually told the person who recruited me back that I wasn't going to come if I didn't have my own lab. Uh, fortunately, I didn't get that in writing. And uh, so that was... Um, that was one of the issues. There were some others as well. 
uh, and then I decided to leave. And and my uh, so so then I actually uh, made a deal that I would keep my unofficial lab going. I had got a lot of funding, and I came back every three months to supervise my lab, and I also supervised them daily. It, it paid off very very well, um, and. Yeah, so that turned out all right in the end. Uh, and then I came back uh, to um, I came back to Melbourne to St Vincent's Institute. I had a self senior author paper in two thousand seven. I actually did most of the work myself and wrote the manuscript. Uh, I moved home. I had successful funding with NHMRC, uh, with the CDA two SRF and two project grants. And then in two thousand and ten, I was also promoted to associate director and associate professor. So then it started going downhill again. So I had a significant funding shortage between 2013 to 2016, and my NHMRC SRF was not renewed at the end of 2015. So I didn't get my sixth year, which most people did get. Uh, from 2007 onwards, funding is a bit better. It's actually really good now. I got two ideas grants at the end of last year, so I'm really happy about that, uh, but that's the best I've ever had with NHMRC. So I want to talk briefly about the, um, the downs. So I didn't really understand why this woman treated me like she did. I had got a first author blood paper within 18 months of being in her lab. I was working towards another paper. I was working hard. I was contributing very well. I was getting along with everyone in the lab. So the reason I was told that I could not become a lab head uh, was that I didn't have enough papers uh, and yet they promoted a man who only had two and then I found out that I wasn't the only woman who they'd done the same thing to at the same time and only just recently. Uh, many people were supportive of me and they tried to get me promoted and I appreciated that. But the lesson learned from that is first of all get everything in writing and also that men and women and treated differently to men. So in 2007, I had my first son. I uh, moved back to Australia in 2008, and in 2010, I had the birth of my second son. So I had significant career disruptions in that major downhill slope as well. And when I was going for my renewal of my 2000, uh, of my NHMRC SRF, I was an associate director, I was doing all these leadership things, I was publishing, I had a clinical trial that had come out of my work. Uh, and so one of my two assessors uh, gave me a track record of leadership score of four. Uh, and because of that four, and only because of that four, I did not get my sixth year. So the lesson learned from that is that NHMRC career disruptions are not working. What should happen? <laughs> Okay. So when we look back, and I only realized this in 2018, and, and I think it was actually partly because of the effects of the hydrosteroids, which really sent me a bit crazy, but it finally unlocked that little part of the jigsaw puzzle that I hadn't worked out, is that that woman that I had worked for had undergone significant gender discrimination and misogynism. And because I was back in Seattle, we actually managed to have a really good chat about it and we both cried. And she said to me, I'm really glad that you worked it out much earlier than me. She just turned 70 and she'd only just figured it out. And so the lesson from that is that you shouldn't internalize anything uh, and you should really communicate your story. And I, I actually started talking about my experience in 2018. So my story is one of many. It made me realize that this is an issue and I love mathematics. I actually, my first career choice was to be a member of ABBA when I was younger. My second career choice was to become a mathematician. I hated Boolean algebra in first year uni. I love blood, but I'm really scared of giving my own blood. I'm not really <laughs> the best at doing that, but I do love blood. So I switched fields, but I still love data. And so, um, so what's really important is that we recognise that there have always been women. Dr. Sue Hassock, who was in that video, I did a summer studentship with her. She was in my field. She left. I thought women were leaving because they wanted to. I didn't realise how hard it was. And it's really important that people realise it is hard. 
and there are a lot of barriers and there are unfair barriers and we need to change them. So if you look at the numbers, you can actually see there's lots and lots and lots of women, many, many at the undergrad and postgrad level, at level A for the doctor, they're still the same, level B. And then once we get to level C, so senior research fellow and onwards, the men start to uh, um, rise and the women start to fall. So this is an issue. And why they say that having a family is a major reason, it's not, it's a myth. And we need to also understand that there's a lot of women without care responsibilities who do not thrive either. Uh, and also it's really important to say that even if you reach level E, you have a higher chance of, of not being continuing in science. It's recognised as well. Melbourne Uni recognise it in their promotions. So it's an important issue. But women have great brains and we want to use them. So why are we losing great women? So there's a lack of mentorship and sponsorship that's changing in recent years, but most of us have not had mentorship throughout our life. Most of us have been lucky if we've had any sponsorship. Misogynism does still exist. It's unfortunate. It does. Uh, I really think the world would be so much better if we didn't have misogynism, racism, any sort of discrimination. And we need to treat each other equally or equitably uh, and with respect. Uh, most women and non-binary people and trans people will have a story to tell. Some men will as well, but it's largely women and non-binary and trans. And it also may affect their behaviour to you, uh, towards you, just like they've really did to me. Uh, so do not judge them. I used to think she was a horrible woman. Uh, she passed away last year. She actually did a lot for underrepresented minorities. Uh, and I've been invited back to Seattle uh, to actually talk at her, her memorial later this year. You have not worked in their shoes. Uh, and unless you know what another person's shoes, their career path has been like, their life has been like, you have no reason to judge them at all and ask them if they want to. It's really hard. The first time I gave my talk, I was really nervous. I've been there so many times now, it's much easier, but um, it's really tough. And bias, both conscious and unconscious, and they're both equally uh, problematic. Uh, conscious is more problematic because that means that someone knows that they're doing it and they're not going to change. It's a major issue and it's prevalent in the peer review system. So I was really fortunate that uh, in 2019, and until my C changed the funding scheme because funding is the main support we need to remain. Uh, and that funding scheme, and I've also looked at ARC, it's a bit murkier, so um, I can't report it here, but so I analysed it, uh, then NHMRC investigated grant schemes. So for those of you who are not aware of the scheme, most of you are, but the gender ideas are not released publicly. So when they do announce the outcomes, they have a breakdown of percentages of men, women, non-binary people, um, and so I actually have to manually identify all of the genders by doing online searches, which is a lot of, a lot of work uh, and matching it up to what's reported. To any non-binary people who might be uh, present today, I apologise. Uh, very few are prior funded and the data, if I've been able to identify them, I have removed because we want to compare men and women to show the results here. Um, and uh, it's really important that non-binary uh, are supported, <laughs> but it's, it's for that reason. Uh, and in 2021, Jess Borgia actually reached out to me after I was tweeting it out for a few years, and she said to me, Louise, we need to write this up. So she and I wrote a Women's Agenda article, uh, and it shocked quite a few people, uh, and then it led to uh, forming the team, which were a group of people who are uh, very advocate, very much advocates on Twitter. So prior to the NHMRC grant restructure, um, more women were funded at the early postdoc level. Uh, and this was actually trying to bring more men over the board. So they used to give men a higher funding rate uh, and similar numbers at the late postdoc level, the career development fellowships. And then you could see that uh, at the senior level, significantly fewer women were funded. When they were funded, it was usually at the lowest level as well. So there was an issue at senior levels, but there were more women coming through in the junior levels. So then uh, for the revised scheme, what happened is that they replaced the fellowship, which was salary only, with salary plus lab support. 
uh, including staff salary. And it became the largest funding scheme in NHMSC. So there are five different categories, EL1, EL2, L1, L2, L3. Uh, and L1 and L3 are all assessed and ranked together. And that's a problem. And I'll show you why. Uh, and the peer review score also directly determined the amount of lab support that L1 to L3 got. So it went from 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 or 600,000 a year. So similar numbers of women and men were funded at the EL1 uh, and to L1 stage, but fewer women were funded after L1. You can see here, this is the first three years of the grant. But women were pulled over the line at all stages, which I find really horrifying um, to achieve these results. So if that hadn't happened and that was done under a um, gender bias, a gender a structural um, priority scheme, then it would have been worse outcomes for women than what they are. And it contrasts with the prior scheme when there were significantly more women funded at that early stage. Now this was no longer happening. I also broke down the data in the different schemes. So basic science, clinical medicine, public health and health services. And it's very, very clear that there was uh, discrimination against the women in the basic science and clinical medicine. And you can't say that there's not a lot of women in those streams. I see a lot, I know a lot. And this was significantly worse as well than the prior scheme. What was even more concerning is that when I looked at the outcomes for the first three years of how much money each person was awarded, uh, the junior L1 lab head women were receiving significantly less funding than the men. Uh, and this was significant every single year. And it resulted in approximately 100,000 less per year minimum than the men. So what that meant is that it affects the women's capacity to increase their productivity. And it also makes them less competitive to renew when they're going up for renewal. Um, and I actually tweeted, before I tweeted this graph out the day before, I said, what would you do if you had 100,000 extra a year for your lab? And it was amazing how many people said, yes, this would make a big difference. And one woman actually messaged me privately and she said, I received an L1 grant this year. I've received 100,000 less than every single man in my institute. It means I cannot employ a postdoc. I can't get future funding with that postdoc and it also significantly impacts my ability to do my work. I'm going to have to continue writing grants to try and get more funding. And even concerningly, even more is that in 2020 and 2021, only one basic science woman was funded uh, and that's a really appalling. Basic science is so important. What we do is not basic. It's so important. It's fundamental. It's the building blocks behind everything. And I do basic through to translational. Without my basic research, I wouldn't be translating anything. And additional data revealed in 2022 by the NHMRC revealed that 60% of women across all levels received the lowest support, uh, whereas 40% of men. So it meant that even L3 women, which we couldn't really get the data from because some people needed salaries, other people didn't at that senior level, um, were actually at a disadvantage. So the investigator grant scheme resulted in poorer outcomes for women than the previous fellowship scheme. In the old scheme, women received approximately 43% of the fellowships and more were awarded to early postdocs than the men, uh, to women. In the new scheme, women receive 37% of the fellowships. That might not sound like a lot of a difference, but it actually is a huge difference. And I actually equated to 288 million difference in the amount awarded to men versus women. I think that's appalling. So the NHMRC came back and said that the predominance of male applicants at the most senior levels of the scheme is a major factor underlying the award of more grants and more overall funding to men versus women. Uh, which is actually incorrect because fewer L3 men apply than any other levels, yet more are funded. And I think this is also disappointing. So our data and historical analysis in many countries reveal that gender bias and peer review funding is a major contributor to the lack of retention of women in STEM. It's an ongoing issue. 
uh, it's not really improving despite awareness and bias training issue, initiatives. And the lack of funding and when funded, the reduced amount of funding awarded uh, causes the research of women in STEM to be less competitive to men at the same level. And as a result, um, mostly I know so many women in my field who have left because of funding issues. Uh, and in Australia, it's so important because we do not have that tenure system that so many other countries do. Um, and it's a shame because we're losing so many great role models, so many great researchers, so many, so many things that can be done. So change is needed. What were the solutions? So I didn't organise the petition. In fact, I didn't even think it would be anywhere near as successful as it was. Uh, so this is all on what's at you, who's not me. <laughs> uh, and they contacted me to ask if they could organise a petition. Uh, we helped draft it. And so if you supported it, thank you, it was key. Uh, in the NHMRC consultations two years ago, uh, and, and Kelso actually mentioned that. So we actually submitted a position paper with a link to this petition in the end of 2021. And in February 2022, the NHMRC released some of their own additional analyses agreeing with our data and also revealing even more gender bias. So it led to the current changes where equal amounts of funding have been awarded to men and women plus non-binary people. And the same research support package of 400,000 is awarded to all of the labs so that there's no uh, discrimination in the future, hopefully. So how's that improved outcomes? So what happens is that this was the uh, allocation of the funding, uh, average allocation between 2019 to 2022, the proportion of funding, and this is how it's changed now. So it actually still reveals that there's an issue because relative to opportunity, it's not being assessed. And one men are down here. You can see that they were higher here. And while it's increasing here, it's, it's, it's um, favoring our one women. So, and, and the problem with that is that, um, oh, and I've also analyzed them all in my ex account. Um, improvements are still required. Relative to opportunity is a major factor to ensure equitable results for everyone. But if you do not know how much funding someone's had throughout their career, you can't determine that. And that's not been assessed at all. I know that people think sometimes that women are getting it easier because they're getting awards when maybe other men are deserving. I've had that said to me. I've had a fraction of the amount of funding that most of the men in my level have had and have achieved a lot more with it and we need to start assessing those outputs. And the assessment of funding outcomes for other underrepresented groups, like ethnicity, LGBTQIA+, disabilities, etc., is also essential. It's not being done at all in the NHMRC. We actually asked them to do this when Ann Kelter was CEO. She said that they didn't know what they would do with the data. I tell you what, I, I know what I would do with the data, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, and institutes are just as responsible. It's really important that institutes step up, realise that equity requires initiatives, it requires additional support, and there's been so much data showing that the more diverse a workplace is, the more productive it is, the better culture, more innovation. So it benefits everyone. So I'd like to stop there. I'd like to acknowledge everyone in the team who have worked hard on this. I'd also like to acknowledge everyone who supported me throughout my life. It's been lots and lots of ups and downs. Um, so many wonderful people in my life and my family. Uh, so, um, but most importantly, my sons, my husband, most of you will know Carl. Uh, it's an old photo, but anyway. Uh, and the best roller coasters I go on are the ones that I go on with my sons. <laughs> Finally, for all of those who knew who might need it, uh, never stop believing in yourself. Thank you very much, Professor Purton. Such an enlightening presentation and horrifying in equal measure measures. <laughs> um, but most importantly now, we'd really like to throw open the floor to questions. Um, if you're in the room, we have the mentee 
Um, oh, sorry, if you're in the room, please just raise your hand. <laughs> we have Teresa and Nicola who have microphones. So please um, start asking questions. And for everybody online, um, we've got our mentee um, code. So um, has anyone got a burning question they'd like to jump in with? I know Laurie will. <laughs> Alicia. Sorry, Laurie. Thanks. Sorry, I'm just gonna grab this. Um, Hello. Hi. Um, I've followed you on Twitter for a while and um, I did some of my own analysis of NHMRC back in the day and then I just left it to you. So thank you for that. Um, I guess with gender, we know what the balance should be, right? 50-50, right? That's where we should be if everything's equal. Right. I'm interested to know how we look at other um, areas such as ethnicity and disability and how we assess whether we're doing it well or not well in the context that where should we be at? Right. Yeah. And your well, we don't have the that. data for that. So the first thing to do is collect that data. We've asked NHMRC, every single institute should do their own uh, analyses. Uh, I know for disability, there should be 20% at least disabled people of whatever reason, including neurodiverse people. Um, but most people who are disabled don't even want to declare their disability because of the fear of discrimination. I'm one of the only openly disabled academics in Australia. I have no issues if people feel that I'm not someone that they want to have, they are not good enough, then that's their loss. <laughs> um, ethnicity, I can tell you from having analysed all that data that we have a lot of diversity in the EL1 and EL2 levels. L1, very few. L2, virtually none. L3, virtually none as well, which is a calling as well. So we need to push for... NHMRC and ARC to be collecting that data, they don't, and they need to report it, and they need to report it transparently, and they need to recognise that we're not trying to blame them for anything, but if they don't analyse, if they don't collect and analyse data that's so important to this country that it's not going to help improve the situation. And we should be proud of the diversity. Look at the diversity here. It is something I love about Australia. I do not like that we're also one of the most racist and sexist countries in the world. And I can say that confidently because I've lived in America and the UK. And I can tell you we are 20 years behind how they treat people. And I've even had men from those countries say to me, it was really appalling how men treat women and other people in your country, and it's true. And I'm, there's a lot of great men here, Michael, I love you. Um, it's changing. It's changing, um, but we need to make sure that accountability is key, and that's it. We need accountability. We need transparency. And collection and reporting of data is so important. Got a question on that side. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, you said that one of the ways to fix the problem or to help the problem is to tell your story, explain where you're coming from. But then you also said you started feeling confident enough to tell your story in 2018. What was it that got you to that point? <laughs> Steroids. <laughs> no. Um, that certainly helped me. That certainly helped me, that's for sure. Uh, no, I actually... I started talking a little bit in 2017 and then in, so I, I started a, a women in science forum in, in 2014 at New Directions in Leukemia Research, a conference I'm presenting at next week. Um, because when I realized that my career was not progressing at it should have been if I was a man and I knew that I had direct comparison with my husband who's nine years younger than me and his career was just going like this and mine was going, Ooh. Um, I knew that there was something wrong. And I started going to some women in science forums and it was just, it was a bunch of women in the room talking and there was someone presenting from their own research funded by ARC saying that the situation's been like this for over 20 years and nothing's changed. 
And I thought, well, it's not going to change if we're just sitting in a room and talking about it. We need men here and we do need more men. It's great to see men here, but we need more men. This is not a women's issue. It's everyone's issue. Um, and so in 2014, I started a Women in Science Forum at this biannual conference. And in 2018, they asked me to share my story. So Suzanne Corey got up first and, you know, she had this wonderful trajectory, et cetera, linear path almost. And then I got up and told my story and it shocked them. And people said to me, you know, we were always wondering why you were pushing gender equity, Louise, and now we understand. So that was the hardest and it was also in front of my peers, my, my field. Um, and it is hard. But the more you give it, the easier it becomes and you also see the impact it has. And so for me, that's worth it. Thanks. A question from Kaz. Yeah. I, I follow you, Louise, as well. Kaz Thersky, I'm the direct, Associate Director of Health Services Research, which, as you see, is still a very early, uh, still got a way to go. Um, my question is, we it, it's not uncommonly then when with my junior um, Sponsor, sponsees and mentees, I tell them to write like a man, particularly when they're putting in award applications. We know that women write differently to men. Women often talk about themselves in a team. They're very humble. So I was wondering what your thoughts were about the, a blinded review of grants where the, the reviewer doesn't know the gender of the applicant. Yeah, well, I, I don't have imposter syndrome. <laughs> um, that's one of my, my things that I don't have. I, I think that Certainly, it doesn't hurt. At the same time, we shouldn't need to. We shouldn't need to fix the system. I mean, we, we shouldn't need to fix ourselves. It should be the system that's fixed. Uh, and if people can't realise research excellence um, by looking at what someone's done with the amount of funding they've brought in, what they've done in terms of leadership, mentorship, et cetera, then that's a failing of the system. So I really don't think that... I certainly, I mentor a range of women uh, who have very different personalities to me. I don't want any of them to change. I think they're wonderful as they are. And it's really important to know that we, we have to be diverse. We have to be ourselves. There's no one better at being you than you. So why should you change? Yeah. Thank you. We've got one, one last question. Just down the back on that side, thanks. Hi, Louise. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, you mentioned earlier that relative to opportunity doesn't really work. And you talked about, you know, the inability to assess past funding and things like that. And that the fact that people with disabilities or other factors that impact their work are not comfortable disclosing. Now, if you go through the process, career disruption is very much focused on like an evidence base. Can you show us that you had this exact amount of disruption. Do you have any ideas or suggestions for how that process could be improved to be not so narrow? Right. So I think that anyone who has given birth should get two years immediately for every career disruption. They shouldn't have to justify how many hours they've spent having maternity leave or paternity leave because that's a small part of having a child. There's so many other disruptions to your career in those first two years. I think five, first five years of both of my son's lives, I was so happy when they went to school. It was <laughs> um, so it gets easier. To those of you with young children, it gets easier, okay? Uh, and, and now my oldest son won't cuddle me at all. So I really, when he turned eight, he was like, Mom, I don't want you hugging me at school anymore. It's embarrassing. <laughs> Luckily, my youngest son still gives me lots of cuddles. It's great. Um, so, yeah, career disruptions certainly need to be improved. I know any time I see it, it, it's a nightmare. I see my understanding is it's better. Uh, I still think that for things like investigator grants, if you are looking at a career-wide effect, you need to know exactly how much, how much funding that person has had in their career. And that not only includes peer review funding, it includes institute support, because you cannot assess anyone. Uh, uh, you cannot compare anyone. I also think in our petition, we requested that equal numbers of L1s equal numbers of L2s and equal numbers of L3s be funded. Uh, we think that's fair. 
Uh, I don't think that L1 to L3 should be assessed together. That's not fair at all. So there are certainly lots of things that can be done to improve. Having said that, it's a step forward what they've done. It was a major game changer. We really were flabbergasted it happened. We're really happy it happened. So um, and I look forward to seeing things improve in the future. There are so many things we can do. We could talk about this all day. Mm -hmm. It would be so nice if we didn't have to, but it's not an equitable world. Um, and we all need to work towards making it one and it'll be so much better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, I'm going to draw a line in the sand there with questions because we do have a lot more to get through today. We've also got a break coming up for morning tea, so I'm sure you're going to be bombarded. Yeah, absolutely. I'm here. So I'd love for everyone to join me to thank Professor Louise Purton again for presenting to us today. Um, I'm sure we've all taken a lot from your presentation, um, seeing all of the data presented that you have analysed and shared via Twitter, X, um, <laughs> over the years has been really informative for a lot of us following along. Um, but to hear it in person in com combination with your experience is um, really speaks to the importance of understanding other people's perspectives, being tolerant and being patient and kind um, in the way that we treat our colleagues. So thank you. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Professor Perth. We are now going to break for morning tea. And um, so please, please join us for refreshments in the atrium. Comms team have assured me it's top notch today for this very special occasion. I'm hungry. I didn't have time for breakfast. And I was super pleased to not do school drop off this morning. Um, so uh, what else do we need to talk about? Oh, um, please don't go anywhere if you're online. Um, we'll be back in, uh, we were going to have 30 minutes, but I think we might do 25. 25 minutes, 20 past 11. We're going to be back in this room, please, for the remainder of this morning's program. Thanks, everyone.
Okay, so welcome back everyone. We hope that you enjoyed the morning tea and had a chance to have some good inspiring conversations um, and maybe meet um, some new people out there. So we've got a jam packed agenda for the rest of um, the morning. Um, so we are delighted that consumer advisor Elaine Curie can join us today. Um, so at Peter Mac, we strive to put the patient um, and their experience at the center of everything and is often um, includes working closely with families and carers too. So this approach extends to our research endeavors. We're proud to have a really strong research um, consumer engagement program um, and are grateful to the people who are willing to share their experiences um, and to help guide and inform our research. And this is a role that Elaine is um, really performing for us here at Peter Mac. So we're really grateful for that. Um, so Elaine will speak on her experiences um, as both a patient as Peter Mac and um, at other health services, and also on her goals in getting involved in our research. So at Peter Mac, a Peter Mac patient since 2020, Elaine Curie is passionate about improving cancer awareness and education and supporting women in leadership. So Elaine has over two decades of experience supporting global organizations in the scientific and health sectors. And with degrees in business and microbiology, Elaine places the patient experience at the center of everything she works on, particularly after having her own cancer experiences. So Elaine now shares her valuable insights and advice from her combined personal and professional experience with our researchers. And today she's gonna to do that with all of us. And we're really grateful to have you come and do um, speak to us today and can't wait to hear what you've got to say, Elaine. Thank you. All right, bear with me. Okay. Thank you, Laurie, for that beautiful in introduction. Um, I'd like to take the next slide. Hello, everyone. My name is Elaine. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which I work, live, and that we are meeting here today. The Wurundjeri people in the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm a solo mom to two beautiful daughters, Abigail and Joanna. We are originally from the white sand beaches of Goa in India, and I've spent the last two decades in New Zealand and now call Melbourne home. I've had an incredible career spanning over two decades supporting global organizations in scientific and health sectors. I have managed and led commercial business portfolios across pathology, healthcare, research in institutes and universities. At the end of the day, my greatest joy is developing people and teams to succeed within their roles and the organization more broadly. <coughs> Did I? I think it just went backwards. Let's try it. Yeah. Too fast. There we go. I think so I'll keep this this way then. <laughs> All right, we've got one step here. I now approach my career post-cancer with the patient-first lens that complements the decades of technical and industry-based experience. But let me take you back to Monday, the 11th of December, 2017 in Auckland, New Zealand. I led a healthy lifestyle and at one of my weight sessions, I assumed I had pulled a muscle. And so I mentioned it to my GP. A physical checkup showed a lump and my GP was surprised given its size and me being in health, that I didn't come in sooner. That afternoon, I was sent to Middlemore Hospital for a scan. The next day I was scheduled to have a mammogram and within the next hour, an ultrasound, which was followed by a biopsy. I broke down as I saw myself a healthy solo mom with two beautiful girls. My career was on track and I was excited for the season I was in. I couldn't believe this was happening to me. I couldn't believe I was hearing the word, the big C word. More tests followed and with it came two possible outcomes. Either that this would be my last Christmas or cancel Christmas celebrations and begin treatment ASAP. I didn't know which one was worse. After years of being involved in diagnostic support, I was now the patient. I was diagnosed with stage three breast and lymph node cancer and would go through chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. 
I began treatment six days after being diagnosed and three days before Christmas. I was that 1% who experienced every possible side effect of chemotherapy. And very quickly, Ward 65 in Auckland Hospital became home. You hear your team talking about pain management, but you don't realize what it actually means until you're suffering through it. My girls were fairly young and had to take up the task of supporting me, managing their student lives and coordinating our little village. We gained some great friends for life and my girls learned that asking for help is okay. Next, I was faced with a 10 hour mastectomy and reconstruction surgery. I'd never been to see a plastic surgeon before, but here were, I was trying to color match my new nipple. Surgery was then followed by sessions of radiotherapy. I had now been over 12, 10 months since I first was diagnosed and since I had last been at work. I found myself not knowing who I was. So many of my features were different. I'd lost my hair lost my eyebrows. I looked like a cancer patient. I worried how work would accept someone like myself. How was I going to manage being taken seriously as I reintegrated into work? Physically, I was different. My body felt weak, but my mind was sharp and was excited to return to work. Through those years, I've gained a tremendous appreciation for what I do at work has a direct impact on the outcomes of pro patient. It was surreal having a CT scan and looking up to see the logo of my company on the very machine tasked with assisting in my diagnosis. It was this firsthand experience that hit home, how crucial it is to ensure that instrumentations work efficiently, assays give accurate results, and images truly show the details because this is what my medical team relied on to give me the best treatment plan. So work is not just work for me. There's a patient at the end of the day who relies on us. The work that my team and I do daily matters a lot more than KPIs. And this is the experience and the message that I advocate for in my professional life. With this new zeal for life in November, 2020, I was ready to embrace a new challenge and relocate to Melbourne on a work transfer. The oncology team at Peter Max supported the remainder of my treatment throughout the pandemic. Initially, I began with day state treatments and infusions before accessing the Peter Mac at home service that delivered hormone treatment from the comfort of my home. As of 2022, I entered remission and have been monitored with yearly mammograms. At first, I was anxious about moving to a new medical team, but the transfer process was smooth and my oncologist was thorough and patient. It helped me relax and have confidence that I was in good hands. The wellness center quickly became a safe space within Peter Mac with its friendly staff eager to offer a cup of coffee between tests and appointments. The oncology massage sessions provided holistic support that complemented my treatment plan and offered much needed relief during such a stressful time. The wellness center also allowed me to meet new families and hear their stories. All of these interactions added to my personal experience and I saw how impactful Peter Mack's approach to patient care truly was. In 2018, I was one of the campaign ambassadors for Look Good, Feel Better New Zealand. As part of this, I led Dry July campaign, helping raise $83,000 to expand services and establish a men's program. I worked with Cancer Society New Zealand, awareness campaigns for breast cancer screening, Daffodil Day Appeal, and the Moving Forward group supporting cancer patients after their treatment is finished. Pictured on this slide is my group. That's us there, which we formally formed nearly six years ago. Our cancer journeys included pancreatic, ovarian, lung, breast, and lymphoma. Though strangers at first, we all had cancer in common. The name moving forward was very apt for us. 
as we all were keen to support each other as we moved forward from our cancer treatments. We continue to be there when one of us is scheduled for a scan, or there's a celebration, or when cancer's back. Our bond is stronger than ever, and we are thankful for cancer that brought us together for life. One of these strong women is Nairi Smith. A woman who never wanted to be part of statistics, yet seven years on, she's still fighting the good fight battling pancreatic cancer. She is one of only 8% in the world to have survived five years after being diagnosed. It's been my honor to support Nairi in the 2022 Pancan Gala with the aim of erasing and raising awareness and education on pancreatic cancer in New Zealand. Through ticket sales, social media, auctions, and sponsorships, we raised over $155,000, which went towards research grants and supporting patients and accessing new treatments. Events such as these are core to my drive in being part of Peter Mack's Consumer Advisory Group to represent and advocate for people like my friend Nairi and many others. Cancer itself can be a difficult journey to navigate. It's isolating feeling like everyone has all the answers except you. Prior to starting treatment, I had a porter cap installed due to my thin veins. It was at a moving forward catch up where we realized that many of us experienced the challenge of finding accessible clothing that allowed easy access to the port. My friend Nairi designed the t-shirt pictured and in my following session, I trialed it. Years on, these t-shirts are still used by many. These group settings allow for shared experiences and issues to be highlighted. It demonstrated to me how important community is in solving these everyday challenges that are truly felt regardless of what type of cancer you have. Here in Mem Melbourne, I had been eager to support my local community. I saw an opportunity to join Peter Mack as a consumer advisor. I was excited at the prospect of collaborating with clinical and research staff by participating in focus groups and sharing my story. I hoped I could bring an understanding of various cancer journeys and perspectives that would help build meaningful strategies. Our scientists sit amongst the best in the world. Having leading treatments is one thing, but for a cancer patient and their family who experiences so much pain and anxiety, I hope to give those families the reassurance that they have a strong advocate representing them even before they step foot in the building. I'm currently on a project with Dr. Jennifer Devlin and Professor Ricky Johnson, who received a grant from Pankind for their project towards a new therapeutic drug for pancreatic cancer. Seeing firsthand my friend Nairi's pancreatic cancer journey, I'm excited to be part of a project that can hopefully extend the lifespan and improve the quality of life of others living with pancreatic cancer. I can't wait to have the opportunity to continue to collaborate and give back and be part of bringing about the change for cancer patients and their families. I hope my story encourages each one of you that what you do matters. I'd like to thank you all, and I'm excited to see the contributions we women make to support patients and families in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, so another, another really enlightening presentation. Um, we really appreciate you sharing with us your experience of your diagnosis and your treatment, um, because I think it really drives home to all of us working in cancer research why we do what we do, which is why partnering with consumers as research partners is crucially important to the progress of all the research we do. Um, I'd like to um, open the floor for questions, and we'll just have a couple if we can. None? I'm happy. Oh, Ricky's got a question. And while you're running down the back, can I just ask if you can give us a key, um, something, a key tip for researchers when thinking about partnering with consumers, what we can do 
to make sure that the relationship is enduring? And then we'll have Ricky's question. Uh, <laughs> I think so the key thing for the researchers is you are the best person in your job. What do you do? Sorry. What do you do with, with the research and the technology and every day that you go into the lab can't beat anything else. And I think so having that human connection with listening to some other patients about their drive and what is challenging for them, I think so will give you much more of a perspective about where you need to put your focus, keeps you passionate, uh, think outside the box. Uh, and as I said in my speech, everything that you do does matter. Nothing that you don't do is going unnoticed. So it makes a big difference for somebody like myself. Thanks, Lane. Ricky? Um, thanks, Elaine. Beautiful presentation. You. Um, you, you touched on two things there that um, perhaps don't get the same sort of limelight that other things that Peter Mac or indeed other cancer centres um, get. And I'm talking about the Peter Mac at Home program yes. um, and then the, the Wellbeing Centre. Yes. Um, and I was just maybe ask you to expand a little bit on that, on how important those two aspects were for, for your journey, actually, um, and what you think we could do to perhaps enhance um, either or both of those programs. Very good questions. Um, at first, the Peter Mac at Home, um, during the pandemic and as I was coming into hormone therapy, um, the travel restrictions. Um, for me, having somebody come into my home and administer treatment rather than me having to drive an hour, go through traffic, having to wear the mask, um, meeting all of the medical other people who are exposed with the immune systems low, um, was perfect. I could have a cup of coffee and here was a nurse who came home, had all of the checks possible uh, because they would check that I was the person who was being administered. And it was so quick and easy and it was in the comfort of my own house. Um, it was, it has been the best thing for me. Yeah. Uh, with the wellness center, um, coming from New Zealand, um, and I'm sure some of you may, may not be able to relate. When you're a patient, all you think about is treatment and having people around you that you can feel comfortable through your journey. Coming to a new country, uh, even though it was a work transfer and I'm excited, uh, you're going to a new medical team. The wellness center for me was like coming home. I was felt welcome. I could relax. I was no longer seen as a patient. Uh, there was a cup of coffee over there, somebody to talk and say, how is your day? Uh, a nice book to read. Uh, there were people around there who were supportive and they said, you know, whatever other things that were there that they could help me with, and not only myself, but also my girls, uh, because it was like, do I just come in for an appointment and go back? But no, there's a wellness center over here where you can actually just sit back. And because I used to go through treatment and then have to have the test done, there was a lot of gaps in between in my day. So having a place where I could just be calm, relaxed, and not to have so much people around me walking around helped my mental health to then be ready to go for my next treatment down the day. I hope it answers. Thanks, Elaine. We're going to have just one last question, and only because it's Tanika. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that inspiring talk. Um, through your experience, if you uh, if there's one reason, one common reason why patients don't want to partner up in research and be consumers, what would it be? I think so it's more awareness. Patients don't want to be after their whole cancer treatment. They don't want to be seen as patients anymore. Uh, so they want, they've got stories, but then sometimes I think you can get too emotional and then they don't want that label of having cancer. They want to be able to move forward from it. And there have been people in my group that we initially formed that some of us have just said, I'm done with the cancer treatment. I just want to get on with life. I don't want to hear anything about it. And so it's just a deliberate choice then to take, okay, to how do I use my story now to help someone? If you see that differently, only then can someone make that change. Otherwise, people with cancer just want to forget about it. Yeah. Thank you so much Thank for you. your presentation. We appreciate really appreciate you being here to share. Thanks.
Um, now, it's on to some presentations from our Leah medalists, and it, it, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Abby Douglas, um, who will be the first of our two Leah medalists to present on some of her work today. Um, congratulations, Dr. Douglas. Welcome to the podium. We're excited to hear all about your work. Thank you. I think I might see, see slides up now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Anastasia. And thanks so much for the um, ability to present to you all today uh, on, on some of my work. Um, so my research focuses on trying to improve the diagnosis and management of infections in heavily immunocompromised patients. And so just presenting some of the work through the PhD I performed um, early in the PhD, we're interested in looking at um, PET-CT and how it could improve diagnosis of invasive fungal infections, which is a really um, troubling condition for heavily immunosuppressed patients. Um, so essentially, uh, Peter Mack has a rich experience with PET-CT, and so uh, I was able to... Uh, interrogate the, the reports of, of, of a rich history, uh, looking for those patients who ended up developing proven or probable invasive fungal infection and looking at how did PET compare to the standard of care, which is CT scanning. Uh, was it able to detect more dissemination because it's a whole body scan? Uh, did it have an ability to, to detect things that we didn't realise before? And could it give us some information about response to therapy because there's a metabolic component to PET scanning? Um, and just highlighting the, the key findings here were that basically um, if PET was able to detect dissemination um, more readily uh, compared to CT, 35% compared to 55%. Uh, and in particular, I think what the crucial finding of this, this study was basically if you had subsequent scans, that PET did give you more information about response to therapy because of the metabolic response on the scan. And I'll show you an in, in, uh, an example here. So essentially, I'm not sure if this works, uh, but basically uh, the top image is the CT scan with the concomitant PET scan. And this really red hot lesion here is some fungus in the lung of a patient who then has treatment. And after treatment and clinical response, they have another scan. And you can see here that that really red hot lesion has gone away, um, which is suggestive that, that, that the active infection has resolved. However, on the scan here, on the CT scan, there's still a lot of change there. And without that metabolic information, you would think that this patient hasn't responded very well. So giving more information earlier, which is helpful because these patients often require very prolonged treatments that can be toxic. So essentially PET suggested that there was ability to detect a range of infections, including in patients who were very immunosuppressed um, they detected more cases of dissemination and was able to give more information about response to therapy, which was helpful as a background to the PIPIN study, which is essentially a multi-centre randomised study that I ran um, comparing FTG PET-CT to conventional CT. This time in patients who have persistent or recurrent neutropenic fever, they are at risk of invasive fungal infection in particular, but also other infections. Um, and uh, in those really immunosuppressed patients, allotransplant, acute leukaemia patients, with the primary outcome looking at how does it help inform our antimicrobial management, because essentially these patients have ongoing fever, they often have escalating antibiotic therapy because of being unsure about what's going on, concerned that they're not being treated adequately. Um, but does PET give us that information that helps guide management? Uh, in essence, this is the primary outcome table, which basically the top row there of rationalisation of antimicrobial therapy is the primary outcome, which showed that PET was more able to guide therapy um, than CT uh, with an odds ratio of 2.3. Uh, and really pleasingly, the main changes there were that it was able to give information that reassured um, clinicians that there wasn't a need for escalation of therapy and in fact therapy could be rationalised so patients are less exposed to prolonged antimicrobial therapy that is unnecessary. Pleasingly from the secondary outcome perspective this did suggest that there was a reduced length of stay in these patients nine days median compared to 12.5 which may in fact be because there is that reassurance that there is nothing we haven't discovered they can be de-escalated they're well enough to go home and there were no signals for adverse outcomes such as ICU admission or mortality. 
And so in essence, in comparison to conventional CT, uh, PET CT appeared to be beneficial in giving information to adequately rationalise therapy and um, potentially led to reduced length of stay and that we should really consider using this in the um, high risk neutropenic fever patient. Um, of parallel to that, we ran a health economics analysis um, with a collaboration from um, Michelle Chu and Kim Darziel from the Health Economics Unit at the Uni of Melbourne. And in essence, um, in aggregate, the PET CT, although it was, you know, when you actually pay for a PET CT compared to CT, it's slightly more expensive. Overall, in the care scheme, it was actually eight thousand dollars cheaper per admission um, with uh, when we use CT uh, because of um, reduced length of stay, less further investigations, less escalating antibiotics, and this uh, uh, this uh, is a health economic. Um, Pain, basically, this is the golden quadrant where you want to see the most um, spots because that means that the, the intervention is less costly and more effective, which is what we found with PET-CT on 74% of simulations. And in fact, if we removed uh, one patient who had a very long ICU stay unrelated to infection, um, it was actually 94%. So again, suggesting that it is cost effective, which helps with the um, decision makers in the room. Uh, finally, moving on to my proposal for my investigator grant, which I was awarded earlier um, this year, or last year, I should say, basically um, looking at expanding on the research I had performed, um, looking at the journey of an acute leukaemia or transplant patient across their treatment, and how can we improve diagnostics and antimicrobial use in these patients. And so just briefly, a patient will have their chemotherapy or their transplant conditioning. And even before they have neutropenia, they may in fact develop fever from their treatments. And oftentimes, generally speaking, we start antibiotics because we're concerned about infection. But in reality, the chance of it being infective is probably fairly low. And we probably can really reduce the antibiotics we use in these patients. So basically um, looking at the rate of infection, the etiologies and um, really building the argument for an early intervention of um, de-escalation of antibiotics. Um, subsequently, patients will then drop their neutrophil counts and develop neutropenic fever. And off the back of the PIPIN study, um, looking at uh, how to implement this FDG PET-CT into the diagnostic algorithm for, um, for these patients. It's one thing to have an RCT, but RCTs don't implement themselves. So looking at implementation piece around how that will work. Um, Importantly, there is also about 50% of patients who actually their fever resolves with antibiotics and we don't find an infection. And what do we do with those patients? Do we leave them on antibiotics indefinitely uh, or until their neutrophil counts recover? And we've, we're learning that that is not necessarily required, um, but we need more study. So uh, um, along with colleagues, I need to run an electronic medical record embedded randomized trial of early de-escalation in allotransplant and acute leukemic patients. And finally, uh, patients with low neutrophils, but also even post count recovery, particularly in transplant when they are at risk of graft versus host disease and requirement for further immunosuppression, um, are at risk of invasive fungal disease, as I mentioned. And there's actually some very exciting technology that is being in mouse models so far, and I'm planning to bring into, or I am bringing into the first in human space is a SIDRA4 PET CT, which is basically more of a pathogen specific um, aspergillus detecting scan. So that instead of patients having to have bronchoscopies and biopsies, which are invasive, we may in fact be able to perform a scan that tells us this patient has aspergillus and can be treated without those nasty invasive procedures. And that's my, uh, my summary of my research and plans to date and welcome any questions. Thanks so much, Abby. Um, you're a real tour de force and can't wait to see the outcomes from some of um, your trials. Um, any questions from the floor for Abby? Should I activate our Minty? <laughs> Thank you. That was a really great talk. Um, I'm just curious, your work is focused mainly on fungal infections, but do you see bacterial infections? And could this be used as well for bacterial infections? Yeah, absolutely. And so sorry, I might not have been clear, but in the persistent recurrent neutropenic fever, absolutely, bacteria is number one. 
uh, and fungi is a, we're actually quite good now at preventing fungal infections with our prophylaxis. So we're actually seeing less and less of the fungal infections. Um, and it's more about um, abscesses and intra-abdominal things or things that we can't see easily on our standard scans, but the PET scans are finding better, such as um, liver, spleen, perianal, where you don't get that good tissue differentiation on standard scans. Um, so definitely, and in fact, um, bacterial infections are far more rapidly fatal and the things that we're most concerned about in the immediate setting and uh, absolutely looking at better ways to manage and diagnose bacterial infection as well. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. That was fantastic. Um, the trial through the EMR, is that... Um, what cohort of patients are you going to follow? Is it just haematology patients or is it broader than that? So um, it is in this setting haematology, so it's acute leukaemia, autologous transplant and allogeneic transplant. There are a small number of solid tumours who do get an autologous transplant, some testicular cancers and others, so you do get a small number of solid cancers. The reason that this study is important though is it, it is because it's those people who do have low white cell counts for a very long time um, and it really is those that group of patients who do have that low count for a very long time where what tends to happen standard of care is if they have their first episode of fever we start antibiotics and then they tend to stay on them until their neutrophil count comes up perhaps three weeks later, which is a heavily exposed patient to antibiotics with the concurrent issues of C. difficile, resistant infection, side effects from antibiotics, the adverse effects on the microbiome. So there's a really greater appreciation now that that's not ideal and we can do better and we need better diagnostics and better interventions to reduce exposure to antibiotics in, in those patients. Nice talk. Um, I don't know very little about this area, so this might be a naive question, but I was wondering what access is like across Australia to the type of imaging equipment you need yeah, for your so studies. Do both patients have to travel long distance to a place like Peter Mac, or could you find it most hospitals in Australia? That's an excellent question. So in essence, most um, tertiary centres now have FDG PET CT um, either on site or within their health service. Um, but there, there is access is, is always a problem. Um, there are a few facets. I guess one thing to say is that most patients who are haematology patients receiving this type of intensive care, um, transplants, acute leukemia, chemotherapy, are actually in those tertiary centres. So they are co-located generally with the scan. Having said that, FDG PET-CT was originally designed for staging and restaging of cancer. So there is that um, issue with time and access to the scanner. Um, so there are more and more scanners coming um, into use, so it improves slowly. Uh, but part of the white reason why we did the health economic analysis was to try and build the, 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 the argument that, yes, um, it's cost effective and you probably could invest more in these scanners to, to improve um, health overall. Um, so, yeah, that's the main thing. That's part of the motivation behind the implementation study as well, though, is that, as I said, it's easy to do an RCT and show, you know, treatment A versus treatment B is better, but actually how does that operate in the real world and how do we practically use the resource best is, is a, a work in progress. Thanks. Great. So in the interest of time, we might leave it there. But thank you so much, uh, Abby, for a really great um, presentation. And yeah, wish you the best um, yeah, in, the, in the future work. Thanks so much, Laurie. So it's now uh, my pleasure to welcome Dr. Deneka Chandranananda, to, who has our second Leah medalist. Um, I'm really excited to hear about your research. Thank you. Well, hello everyone again. Um, my research revolves around circulating tumor DNA. Now, uh, these are highly fragmented DNA molecules that are released by tumor cells into the bloodstream of cancer patients. Um, and uh, we know that mostly these uh, fragments are released when cancer cells die, but a certain proportion are released or actively secreted by living tumor cells. 
And these DNA fragments carry various alterations and signatures that are present in the tumor, which all means that by taking a simple non-invasive blood sample followed by DNA sequencing, we can get access to the landscape of the cancer. And this is termed a liquid biopsy approach. Uh, I lead a bioinformatics team and we build various computational tools to pull out these different layers of tumor data from circulating tumor DNA. Now, we are really interested in pulling out somatic changes such as mutations, copy number alterations and sort of mutational signatures. Uh, but we also pull out epigenetic um, uh, signatures and markers such as methylation. And then sort of going beyond genetic and epigenetic signals, we also are really interested in the structural properties of these circulating fragments. You know, what are their sizes? What are the nucleotide motifs at the end? Do they have preferential cut sites in the genome? Um, so these are structural properties that we uh, pull out. And we've also developed a tool to infer gene expression from DNA. Um, and instead of focusing on just like one type of this data, we integrate all of these layers through machine learning to get a more comprehensive understanding of a patient's cancer. Uh, we regularly apply our tools to patient samples from different clinical trials uh, across various contexts. So we aim to detect um, cancer, uh, the presence of cancer in blood samples in its early stages before metastatic spread. And then we also use serial blood samples from each patient to um, get an understanding of um, how they are responding and sort of the trajectory. And of course, we are really interested in investigating how a cancer evolves when there is that therapeutic pressure. Um, because of all of the biological data layers we pull out of our data, we try to get a very comprehensive understanding of why some patients respond to a treatment and others do. And we can look at this across the genetic, epigenetic, and fragmentomic information layers. Um, and we also try to really hone in on features that predict patient survival. So this all looks pretty stra straightforward, right? Circulating tumor DNA exists in patients. Uh, the DNA sequencing technologies have come really far and we've developed a set of tools to you know, pull out the information we want, but it's never that easy. So we're faced with a couple of different issues every time we analyze liquid biopsy data. The, so the first is that the tumor DNA fragments exist in an ocean of DNA fragments that come from healthy tissue, mainly the hematopoietic system or blood cells. And so this is really a needle in a haystack problem. And we are trying to get at this minute signal. And also, uh, we know that patients with the same tumor subtype uh, have you know, quite a lot of heterogeneity in their cancer landscape. So that is true biological variability. But these patients shed circulating tumor DNA at different rates as well. So when we try to find a common signal between a, you know, a set of patients, say people who respond to a treatment, these two factors of biological variability and the ctDNA or circulating tumor DNA fraction in blood confound each other. And the third main barrier is sort of self-imposed. Um, we, whenever possible, we try to go for low cost sequencing and that leads to low coverage of the genome. And um, this, we do this deliberately because this facilitates clinical translation of our methodologies if they are cheap. But uh, this adds a, another layer of complexity and we do uh, tend to lose some signal. So we've had to be very creative as well as couple that with common sense in order to overcome these barriers. 
So these are some of the things we do. I mentioned before that we look at the structural properties of the circulating DNA fragments, right? The sizes, DNA motifs, et cetera. So we try to leverage differences between DNA fragments from the tumor and DNA fragments from healthy tissue to really select for the cancer signal. And I can tell you that um, DNA fragments from the tumor are generally shorter. They actually have specific motifs at their uh, start and ends, and they prefer specific sites in the genome. And we also try to sequence panels of healthy individuals in our projects to get a thorough understanding of the background signal we need to filter out and how that varies between individual to individual. And nearly all of our tools are built to analyze at the patient level to get a better understanding of heterogeneity. But also when we look at a cohort of patients, say responders to treatment again, um, and there's variable tumor fraction across these patients, we try to exploit that. So we then select for features that correlate with tumor fraction because then it gives us confidence that this is a cancer signal and it's not coming from blood cells. So, uh, all in all, my vision is to build highly accurate tools and unlock the full potential of liquid biopsies. And I really strive and hope that our methodologies um, reach the clinic. If you talk to anyone who has done a biopsy, they will tell you how painful they are and how much anxiety is, is associated with them. So um, at the end of the day, I. I do what I do because I want to provide an alternative to patients um, for invasive tissue biopsies and give them something minimally invasive and possibly less anxiety inducing. With that, I'd uh, like to acknowledge all of the people who have been involved with this work. So uh, uh, people in the Dawson Labs, you know who you are. I'd like to thank our local and international collaborators, um, uh, the fantastic and hardworking staff at the Bioinformatics and Genomics course at Peter Mac, the staff at the Translational Genomics Center. Um, there are my funding sources, but the biggest thank you goes out to the patients who consent to participate in our studies and the families that support them. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ch Chandrananda. Um, that was a masterclass in science communication. <laughs> uh, for someone who comes from a bit of a different research area, health services, um, I love hearing about liquid biopsies because they offer patients um, so much, there's so much potential, as you pointed out, with a um, less invasive aspect of having a blood test compared to having a tumor biopsy. Um, also, lots of potential with for cancer screening, hopefully in the future the more population-based approach. Um, I think we have a question over Kylie. Thanks, Kylie. One of the things in exciting areas of research. Mm -hmm. I was having conversations with my consumers last year, and the one thing they wanted during their follow-up after their surgery, and as far as they know, they don't have any cancer, they, they, they want to be reassured regularly that they don't have cancer coming back. And they yes. find hard to access scans, mm -hmm. um, and, and because often people have concerns about coming in. Can you see a future where this becomes cheap enough, incentive enough that they could, they could have a test every three months if they, if they wanted to? And if you were going to put your money on a particular analyte or method, what would it be? Uh, that's a really good question, Kylie. So right now, I think um, the consensus is that liquid biopsy should be uh, offered in specific contexts uh, for patient groups that uh, are more likely to relapse, especially sort of serial monitoring of them. But, uh, but I don't think it will anytime soon, it will be offered as something like a diabetes test. So I think it still needs to be context specific because we need to get these accuracy levels up, the false positive and false negative rates up in order for it to be, you know, reach that kind of wider population level. But it is something that's, that we should really strive for because the anxiety around waiting for one year 
to get your next MRI scan, I think uh, is something, if, if you can elevate that anxiety, that would be excellent. And in terms of the analyte, so uh, uh, there have been studies looking at multi-analyte. So this is all from uh, blood plasma, uh, but then circulating DNA is found in the cerebrospinal fluid, the urine, you know, highly fragmented, but the signal is there and uh, saliva even. So I think it's also context dependent. Where is your cancer? If it's renal cancer, for example, the signal might actually be there more in the urine sulfury DNA rather than in your blood. So uh, yes, it's, it's something we need to be flexible in how, um, how we do the research to sort of propagate all of these analytes uh, in, in the same way, to the same level, but also then think about integrating them. One question for Maddie. Oh, thanks, Nicola. Yeah. Thank um, incredible uh, presentation. I haven't done science since undergrad and I understood anything, everything, so great work. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, my question sort of comes, you, you sort of spoke about like patient to patient variability. Yes. Um, and I guess kind of viewing that with a bit of a, diversity lens so I guess do you see that there there might be some restrictions here and the fact that you're getting samples from clinical trials and the kinds of people who enroll in clinical trials are we seeing an impact to that all the way down at, at DNA level and so that the the kind of demographic of a, of a person you're collecting the DNA from and, and the tools that you're designing here is that possibly going to lead to an inequity in, in these uh. tools down the track. Yes, we, uh, the tools that we design are, um, I really try to think of them as not being sort of gender specific or it, it's, it's trying to pull out genome-wide data from the patient. Uh, so, and because we look at patient level, if your cohort is diverse and if there are differences, it will come through because we are looking at that patient level. So I don't think that the tools themselves will lead to any sort of inequity down the line. But yes, it would be um, good to have representation in these clinical trials. Did we have a question on this side? Maxine, thank you. Um, so we already use machine learning, so, sort of, if you think of the genome, three billion base pairs, right? Mm -hmm. You add, so all of the mutations that come from that, you add a methylation data layer, you add these other layers, and you sort of need machine learning and AI to sort of uh, reduce that signal down to something that's workable. Right now, because we don't trust AI as much yet, mm -hmm. we could put a lot of support into that models because we are the experts. We select, say, regions of the genome that are more important for certain types of cancer and not let the machine do all of that. But I see, I do see with better and better training data to model and uh, train those models, uh, we can get um, a, a better participation of AI in this type of research. And I know that for imaging research, AI has been crucial. So I think for genomics uh, research as well, um, it, it, we will go far. Thank you so much. I think we might have to leave it there because we are running a little bit late, but thank you so much to make an amazing presentation. Um, now I'm going to introduce our final invited speaker for today, Professor Sue Walker AO. Professor Walker has been head of the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Newborn Health at the University of Melbourne since 2016. She's also the chair of the Division of Perinatal Medicine at the Mercy Hospital for Women and is co-director of Mercy Perinatal, a centre of excellence in clinical care, education and research in high-risk pregnancy. Professor Walker's research interests focus on improving the detection and management of fetal growth disorders, treatments for preeclampsia and prevention of stillbirth. Please join us, join me in welcoming Professor Sue Walker.
Thank you so much um, for the warm introduction. Um, I'm so grateful to be invited here um, and to see the Lee medalists. What an extraordinary um, future we have. Uh, the presentations from Abby and Danica in particular were just stellar and it's a real honour for me to be invited here. Um, as you can see, I'm a little bit out of field. I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist, uh, not a maternal fetal medicine specialist as I have been introduced in the past. So I'm not one of those, um, but um, so I'm speaking a little bit out out of field but it's kind of nice to do that but for that reason I'm not going to talk a lot about my own research I'm going to talk a little bit more about the research journey um, and perhaps thinking about some tips particularly looking at some young people around the room um, and I was talking to my daughter the other day who's living in London at the moment you know where the skies are gray and the days are short and I said oh hey you're surviving in uh, in London in winter subtext when you're coming home um, and um, and she said oh mum you know what it's awful but we just went to the beach on the weekend because she said I needed to see a horizon and she said you know I've lost track of the fact that in Australia you can see a horizon anywhere parklands ocean and whatever else but with high buildings and low clouds she said I just needed to see a horizon. So I was a bit inspired by that very astute observation of hers and today we're going to talk a little bit about seeking horizons. It's such a primal urge for us all and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we all need to know. What does my horizon look like? What's that point in the distance that I say that's where I'm pitching for in my career and in my research? I want to know how are you going to get there? I want to be able to explain that to people. I want to have my horizon, as Mary Oliver says, what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? But I also need to be able to signpost it to people and say, hey, this is how I'm going to get where I'm going. This is your impact story. I'm going to talk about the low clouds and the high buildings and what is it that blocks our views? And then finally, I'm going to talk about how can we improve the views, not just for ourselves, but for our teams. How can we lift everybody up so they can look a bit beyond and go, that's right, that's where we're headed. So I'm very fortunate to be a clinician and a clinician researcher. So I'm lucky to inhabit the space where clinical curiosity and scientific discovery collide. But I also have a huge team um, of people around me, um, basic scientists, um, you know, ultrasonographers, geneticists, clinicians, and so forth. And when you're going for a far horizon, I think it's wise to remember that phrase that if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And I think we've heard a lot about that already this morning. So where's my horizon? Well, when I think about my horizon, I do think about this person. And with some trepidation, it's an old white male, so I'm very sorry about that. But anyway, um, this is Professor Jane Peckman, and he's a Nobel laureate. He's a professor of economics, actually, at the University of Chicago, and he proposed this. This is the Heckman curve. This is saying that if you look at the society economics, whether you're looking at education or workforce retention or economic viability in the society, we sometimes invest too late. What we need to do is invest in pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, early postnatal care. And so I suppose this concept of the earlier and best, the greater your return, this is kind of what has set my horizon. That is of the all important first nine months and how that can have such an extraordinary legacy on all of our lives. It was the most important nine months of our lives in some respects in determining our long-term health. So my horizon is really about safer motherhood, and the best possible start to life. And so if I was going to then get out my GPS and say, well, how am I going to get to that horizon? There are three coordinates on my GPS. And that is by providing excellence in clinical care in high-risk pregnancy. It's with education. And it's what we're talking about today with research. And so I guess the three pillars of my life are to connect, to inspire, and to discover. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about for this first bit of the talk. So connection as a clinician is hugely important to me. I love working in multidisciplinary teams. I love bringing patients and families along when things are very complex. Um, the thrill of turning family, uh, couples into families inspires me still. But perhaps now I work in the pointier end of high-risk pregnancy where I'm dealing with mums who have maybe had cancer, organ transplant, cardiac disease. Their baby has concerns about severe problems with growth or development, or we're looking at cases where I'm going to have to go in and do fetal surgery or fetal intervention to get that baby safely through, safely through to the other side. So that's kind of my clinical role in high-risk pregnancy, to try and get those pregnancies as far as I can and get those mothers and babies safely home.
The next thing I'm going to turn to is what about inspire and education? And I know many of you will have, you know, big research portfolios and you come to that PDR and think, oh, I'm teaching. What am I doing in teaching? But education is so much more than teaching. When I think about education, I think that this is really signposting the horizon for the people who are around us. And when I just sort of define education, I think about how am I going to transfer knowledge and skills and experience and values and behaviour to the place where it's needed. And we are all educators. So what does that mean? It means, of course, students and trainees, no one loves a didactic lecture more than I do, as you can tell. But it's more than that. It's also about how do we give effective feedback? Uh, spoiler alert, it is not the compliment sandwich. Doesn't work. Um, so how do we give more effective feedback? Phrases I've been using lately are things like, in my career, I've really benefited from some feedback and I'd like to pay that forward. Is it okay if I give you some feedback? Or when I'm doing a surgical list, I said at the beginning of the list, hey, I like to give feedback after every surgical list that I do. Would you like me to do that as we go or at the end? That is, there's no way from getting away from it. So how would you like me to give, <laughs> give that feedback in a really warm, it just sets the tone that this is part of how we do business. This is how we educate and learn better. We need to have career conversations that are meaningful and more than the PDR. Now, don't get me wrong, I was not giving career advice to Brett Sutton here, um, but, but this was sort of a meeting that we had where it was great to hear about his career. What were the challenges? How do you get forward? How do you manage during a crisis of a pandemic? And of course, there is professional development. This was our um, fetal medicine at Twilight series. I run it about every six weeks, had about 1500 online last week. And the great thing about that is it takes it where it's needed to rural and remote Australia, where it is sometimes very difficult to penetrate with education. And the group that I hadn't thought about, the people who said to me when I was on maternity leave, Twilight kept me going because it kept me connected with my profession and what's up to date. So there's a lot to do in the education space that is more than teaching. And just a year or so ago, we did a whole seminar on who's holding your ladder mm -hmm. to support women in uh, research leadership. And then last year, how do we bring hearts and minds together in leadership development in healthcare? So as you can see, I love the education side of my life as well, but I'm now going to turn to the research and to the discovery piece. And as you've heard, there's probably two big programs of research that I'm involved with finding an effective treatment for preeclampsia, the serious medical condition that occurs during pregnancy, and finding better ways to identify the placenta that is failing and the baby who is going to be at risk of late pregnancy stillbirth. So I'm just going to tackle one of these today and talk a little bit about our work in preeclampsia, because I think this is really about if you want to go further, go together. So some of you won't be, um, uh, won't have been involved in reproductive health research. So I'm just going to give you a little recap about preeclampsia. So this is the placenta, all right, the oxygen and nutrition supply organ for the baby. But when it doesn't get very well embedded in the uterus in early pregnancy, it becomes hypoxic, it becomes ischemic. And it starts releasing these anti-angiogenic factors into the maternal circulation. That is these factors that go and start causing damage in the biggest organ in our body, in the endothelium. And so it attacks all of mum's blood vessels and it causes vasospasm, it causes platelet aggregation, it causes capillary permeability. I'm going to stop right there because we've got an endothelial biologist in the room and we're going to find the bottom of my knowledge about endothelium very soon. But it attacks the endothelium. And it causes the problems of hypertension, kidney disease, liver disease, seizures, brain hemorrhage, coagulation failure. But it also affects the organ that is the culprit in the first place. It makes this more ischemic. It makes it more hypoxic. And so we get this positive feedback loop. We get consequences for the baby with fetal growth restriction. And as you can possibly imagine, therefore, the only way this gets better is to deliver the placenta and therefore the baby, sick, small, ready or not. And so preeclampsia worldwide is responsible for about 70,000 maternal deaths and about half a million perinatal deaths. So what does the horizon look like here? Could we come up with a treatment for preeclampsia that is more than just get rid of the placenta and inflict on the baby the prematurity that is going to have lifelong consequences for it? And if we were, we would want to target these factors, and there's a couple of ways that we could do it. Can we decrease release of soluble flit and soluble endoglum from the placenta? Could we remove that from the circulation somehow so it doesn't exert its end organ effects on the endothelium? Or could we somehow protect the blood vessels from soluble flit and soluble endoglum? And if we were looking at a medication like that, it has to be able to be taken orally, 
It has to be cheap and off patient and not need a cold chain. All right, I'm, we're not really looking here for $50,000 a dose drugs that we can only use in high income settings when the burden of disease is overwhelmingly carried in low and middle income settings. And finally, we're using this in pregnant women. So we have to use something that we know to be safe in pregnancy, which really turns us to repurposing drugs that we already know have indications in pregnancy that are safe. And our current target is metformin. And um, I'm very fortunate to um, work with Professor Stephen Tong, but also Nat Hannon, to our Cacciolino, who are two of our, um, clinician, uh, our clinicians and scientists, and Fiona Brownfoot, who did this work in her PhD of looking at what were the effects on the endothelium and placental release of soluble flitin and doglin. And then I was fortunate enough to have a maternal fetal medicine trainee who was with us from Cape Town, South Africa. And she said, if you'll supervise my PhD, I'll take it to clinical trial. Thought that sounds a bit implausible, but that's what she did. <laughs> so she did the first trial, um, which was isomeprazole, which didn't work. But this is PI2. This is our preeclampsia intervention trial for preterm preeclampsia. It was a randomised double-blind RCT, 180 women with very preterm preeclampsia. Now, remember, the reason that we are taking this to South Africa is that's because that's where the burden of the disease is. And importantly, there isn't the neonatal care that there is here. If you get bad preeclampsia in Melbourne at 29 weeks, we'll bail out and take the baby to the nursery and the baby will do pretty well. But you just don't have those resources in lower middle income settings. So she's got a great population of patients who are sitting hoping that they can cobble together enough days and enough weeks that they might be able to take a baby home. So she's now a full professor. I'm very proud of her. Um, and she's based in Tigerberg Hospital down here in, uh, in, the, in the Western Cape. So these are the very many women of the PI trial. Um, and as I say, they were inpatients. They were randomised to either metformin or placebo. Um, and we we're fortunate to get this published in the BMJ uh, just a couple of years ago now. Um, this was the chart where you can see we recruited 180. We had almost a complete follow-up of that group. Um, table one, randomization was effective. There was no difference between the two groups. But what we found was that we did get a prolongation of pregnancy um, of about seven days between metformin and the placebo. It's on a median, and as you can see, that very painful p-value there when we uh, when we did the analysis, but that's okay. Um, we then did we did look at our pre-specified per protocol analysis, that is, of people who took the drug, and we saw that there was a longer prolongation of gestation, and those that were able to tolerate maximal dose, we were able to get them out to almost two weeks. So we sort of thought, like, okay, this looks like it's plausible. The secondary outcomes, there were no differences. There was a trend towards increased birth weight in the metformin group and a trend towards shorter neonatal length of stay. And this is exciting for us because this really is the first study to demonstrate an agent that can prolong gestation in pregnancies complicated by preterm preeclampsia. Now, is this ready for prime time? Not yet. All right, this is 3% of pregnant women get preeclampsia. All right, we're not going to be rolling this out until we've got the confirmatory trial. PI3 is underway in South Africa, a bigger study, and also PI4 is now going in Scandinavia and in Denmark. But we really hope that this could be a game changer for this devastating disease that causes so much maternal and perinatal death. So in terms of seeking the horizon, um, I guess what's my horizon look like? Safer motherhood and the best possible start to life. And how are you getting there? This is going to be your impact story. And for me, it's about saying this, the, the game here is to connect and to inspire and to discover. So I'm just going to check in with our organisers. I know we're running a little bit behind. Would you like me to sort of stop there or just keep going for another Another 10? You okay with that? Yep, good. Okay, no problem. Sorry, everyone, if you were just thinking, yay, she's going to wrap up. All right. The thing that I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of things, and I might move through some of these pretty quickly. All right. What things block the view? Um, first one is this. Now, I've discovered that Louise does not have imposter syndrome, but I suspect that a fair few of us in the room do. So recognising that this is a very common problem. I was going to say it's a universal problem, but it's a very common problem, all right, where you are doubting your abilities, 
you know, despite often very outstanding accomplishments, and this does have a little bit of a gender bias, that women are much more likely to doubt their, their space in the room. And you also have this fear of being found out, all right, that you're worried <laughs> it's being exposed as a fraud and it results in a lot of self-doubt. And I often think about our new doctors and probably new people in your labs as well. When they first come and you say, how are you going? And they go, I'm fine. It's actually more important to say, you know what, you are doing great, all right, and reinforce them that are doing fine rather than ask them because they've got all of these black clouds in the back of their mind. Um, because how it plays out is a variety of ways and I can put my hand up for all of these responses, all right? These are the ways that we respond to feeling like an imposter um, and that's not a terrible thing necessarily and I'll continue with these behaviours, I'm sure, but nevertheless, we should just recognise that this can in fact be quite destructive. Um, and so you're not alone and um, almost everyone does feel like an imposter sometimes and that's okay. And rather than take you through this in the interest of time, I've got some QR codes there just for anybody who might be interested in looking a little bit more at some of these resources about what are some practical strategies to manage imposter syndrome, please come and see me afterwards. I have dealt with all of them. All right. The next thing I was going to touch on is failure. Um, because everybody in this room has got a I regret to inform you CV, all right? We've got a shadow CV that sits behind the glossy one that we put up for promotion and for funding. Um, and the shadow CV, um, well, I started nice and early. Um, you're invited to meet the Dean at Unsatisfactory Progress, uh, so that was good. But my MRFF was unsuccessful, reviewer three, need I say more. Your project grant was unsuccessful, your investigator grant was unsuccessful, your program grant was unsuccessful, and this is unsuitable for publication and your job application was unsuitable. So I just want to put it out there that most of us, I'm looking at Louise desperately for a nod, yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry our logos just sort of appeared on that. But, um, you know, um, I think all of us have got this shadow CV, no matter how successful you might think some of those heroes of yours are, everyone's got a shadow CV, everyone knows how it feels. Um, but it feels bad, you know, and how does the brain respond when we have failure? Um, and it's kind of interesting to look at the imaging. Now, I'm conscious that, you know, not everybody in the room is a clinician, but what I'm going to show you now is some imaging of what happens when you experience failure. It's such an, inter you know, a profound feeling. So it's, it's complex imaging. I'm going to walk you through it, okay? So this is the control brain. Right? We've got the, the rational, we've got the rational decision maker. All right. So this is the control, and then you have failure. Yeah. The failure monster, right? All right? So it's subtle. I'm gonna take you back to it again. Rational decision maker, failure monster. All right. Failure monster completely hijacks the amygdala. All right. It says, I'm just gonna bypass that frontal cortex where there's reason and rationalization and sensible thinking. And I am just going to have a nice little narrow shift that goes like this. Who cares? It was stupid anyway. It's probably someone else's fault. Um, at three o'clock in the morning, it likes to have dialogues like you are a catastrophic failure at everything and everybody thinks so and you should quit. All right. So this is the failure monster in full flight. All right. And we need to reel that back in. So how might we do that and get the rational decision maker back in control? So the first thing I would suggest is that you do nothing. All right. Step away from the keyboard. Don't send an email or um, some vexatious complaint straight away. All right, just sit with it for a sec. Have a good wallow. Very important to our ladies. Have a little bit of time to have a bit of a wallow. Try and avoid that moving into resentment. You know, why did they get it? Why didn't I? Because it actually doesn't help you. It doesn't help anybody going forward. So just when you see that coming, just say, oh, that might be the failure monster talking. But it is important to analyse the mistake and look at how you can adjust course. All right, because as Churchill said, success does just consist of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And I think all of us in science can relate to that. Okay, a final couple of points. How can we get people onto bridges, up ladders and into helicopters so they can get away from this problem of not being able to see the horizon? Now, this seems like such a basic slide to even put up. I'm slightly embarrassed to do it, but it's so important about this whole secure your own oxygen mask before helping other people and the importance of self-care, looking after yourself, um, getting enough sleep, connecting with the things that bring you home to yourself and that bring you home to others. Um, 
maximizing your EQ in the workplace. Um, and this helps you and it helps others. And I guess I've always struggled a bit to have a good sort of framework for EQ. And I love this one because it talks about yourself and it talks about others and it talks about awareness and then moving into action. So in terms of self-awareness, I think you want to have that self-reflection of, am I bringing a calm, steady energy to this situation or am I actually transmitting anxiety, stress and frustration to people around me? And then how do you manage that? All right, the, the power to do better lies between stimulus and response. Just taking a moment, take a beat, take a breath, call a pause in the meeting if you need to, but you just need to be able to focus what's in your zone of control and how you're going to take the heat out of that situation. In terms of managing others, it does mean listening with a caring presence, all right? So unhurried listening, listening to understand, not rushing to respond and making sure you recognise the people in your team. And in terms of social management, making your workplace safe, consider those nudges about behaviour, you know, the visitor sign. We ask you to respect the energy you bring to in this space. Our patients and clinicians matter. Things like that, a proactive call to behaviour. It's wise to assume that everyone is doing their best. Everyone comes to work to do a good job. It's wise to assume that. And I'll start our m, &M meeting with that every single time. Everyone comes here to do a good job. And then when you're in a difficult conversation, just slow down. This is difficult. Um, this is important. Let's go slow. So um, I guess when we're leading people, we do want to lead with empathy and kindness. And, uh, you know, you don't want to be here, all right? So you don't want to be uh, low, where you are low in kindness and low in competence. You don't really want to be Mr Burns either, who's pretty competent, but just frankly mean. Homer's great, but a little bit low in competence. Um, if you get a choice, be a Lisa. Um, and so um, I guess my final thoughts, uh, or maybe be Taylor. We've talked a lot today about eras and horizons. Um, and she's an A-lister, and I've got an A-list for you as well. I think as researchers, I want you to envision that we've got a Rubik's Cube, we've got the, we've got the breadth, we've got the height, we've got the depth, and these things all have to be in balance. And my A-list is this, and this is first about your motivations in research. You have to have ambition and altruism pretty evenly weighted, all right? We do want the big thinkers, the people who can sell great stories and whatever else, but we also want the people who go second last on the paper, who build up the juniors and who build up the team around them. And as I get more senior, my ambition should be tied up in your ambitions. Those things should be coming closer together. That's one axis. If we go to the next axis, when you think about what about our research behaviours, we need to be agile, that's for sure. We need to be able to respond to funding calls, collect the clan together and move fast. But we also need to be accountable. We need to be accountable to those who fund us. We are funded for and by the taxpayer and anyone in the lift should be able to hear what's your horizon and where are you taking us to? And that's what we've heard so beautifully today. And then finally, the last two things, uh, what about our own personal qualities? And my A list there is you need to be assiduous. That is great perseverance and great care, but you also need to have really strong allies. That is, you need to assemble your clan around you and you need to make sure that collectively you are able to bring each other forward to see the horizon and to take us forward. And so that is my final concluding slide. Um, there's one thing that holds the Rubik's Cube together and that's the final A and that's authenticity. It has to be something about what we are doing that brings us home to ourselves, that deeply resonates with us. And I can hear from what I've heard today that that really exemplifies the work that's been done here at Peter Mac and Louise and the others who've spoken today. So improve the view, self-care, lead with EQ and IQ, a mixture of grit and grace in your leadership. And um, the A-list, just go to the Eros tour. But if you can't do that, uh, the A-list of academic life. And I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Sue. That was amazing. Um, we've got time for one super quick burning question. If there is one in the audience. 
other ones I'm here after I'm very happy to yes so maybe, and maybe because we are a bit behind yeah we can have discussion afterwards but thank you so much that was really inspiring and I'm sure a lot of the junior people out there in the audience and also senior people really took something from that so thanks a lot no worries thanks sorry Okay, and I'm just going to pass over to um, uh, Professor Jason Payne to close up the day. Thanks, Laurie. Um, what an act to follow. Thanks, Sue, for that amazing presentation. Um, so having taken up the position of Chief Executive at Peter Mac in uh, November, this is the first Women in Science Symposium I've attended, and what an absolute honour it has been to do so. It's an amazing event. Um, and I've learnt so much about uh, the work that we do here and from the amazing presenters who've spoken today. It's really um, heartwarming, exhilarating, uh, thrilling, and there's been times of emotion too. It's absolutely fantastic. I also want to say that this being her final symposium as board chair, I want to thank Professor Maxine Morand for her continued support of events like this and our gender equity initiatives more broadly. Um, you can rest assured, Maxine, that we'll continue the work um, that you've been involved with and, and championing for so many years with as much passion as you have in your absence. So thank you very much. It says so much about the culture here at Peter Mac that um, we make the effort to improve gender equity so seriously. I really appreciate the supportive and celebratory atmosphere of today's event and the kind and collegial approach that we've taken to understanding different viewpoints and experiences. Today has highlighted some of the many varied experiences of women in medical research in Australia and what a pleasure it has been to hear from them. Listening and understanding is the key to making the kind of progress we need in this space. And I do want to encourage any men um, in the audience today to get involved in equity initiatives. There are meaningful contributions that we can make to advancing this work. And I believe that achieving a more equitable and fairer workplace is everyone's responsibility. Finally, I want to um, extend my sincere thanks to Associate Professor Forrest and Dr. Smith for being such great hosts today. Not only do you put an enormous amount of uh, effort and planning into this important event, but also your leadership as co-chairs of the research, gender, equity, diversity and inclusion group has seen it go from strength to strength. Thank you to the whole JEDI group for your wisdom, passion and foresight. And once again, thank you so much to our amazing speakers. Um, you really made our day and made the event um, the success it is. And congratulations to our Leah medalist for this year. We hope this award and the attached um, support helps you to advance your work further. So we hope that you take some really valuable insights away with you today, uh, whether from our guest speakers or hearing about the way that we do things at Peter Mac. So thank you very, very much for joining us today and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.